The June 8, 2021 meeting of the Public Safety and Human Services Committee will come to order. It is 9.32 a.m. I'm Lisa Herbel, Chair of the Committee. Will the Clerk please call the roll? Council President Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Lewis. Here. Councilmember Morales. Here. Councilmember Sawant. Present. Chair Herbold. Here. Five present. Thank you so much. So on today's agenda, we will be hearing three items. The first is a roundtable with city and community partners to discuss the crisis response continuum that is currently operating in Seattle with an emphasis on those that respond to low level crimes and behavioral health crisis. This is part of the council's work to reimagine community safety and better understand the possibilities of non-armed responses. We have participants from each the Downtown Emergency Service Center's mobile crisis team, LEAD, the Seattle Police Department's Crisis Response Unit, the Fire Department's Health One, and Crisis Connections. For that, we'll hear a presentation from the Office of Emergency Management on the All Hazards Mitigation Plan update. And then finally, we'll hear a presentation from the Council's own Council Central Staff, Carlos Lugo, on the criminal legal system realignment work that he's been pursuing. So we'll now move into approval of the agenda. If there's no objection, today's agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. In this point, we'll be moving into public comment. I will moderate the public comment period so that each speaker is given two minutes to speak. I will call on each speaker by name and in the order in which they registered on the council's website. If you've not yet registered to speak, but would like to do so, you can sign up before the end of the public comment hearing by going to the council's website. The link is also listed on today's agenda. When I call a speaker's name, you will hear a prompt. And once you've heard that prompt, you will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Please begin by speaking. Uh, by stating your name and the item which you are addressing. Because we'll hear a chime when 10 seconds are left of the allotted time. And once the speaker hears the chime, we ask that you begin to wrap up your comments. If speakers do not end their comments at the end of the allotted time period. The speaker's mic will be muted after 10 seconds to allow us to hear from the next speaker. Once you've completed your public comment, please disconnect from the line. And if you plan to continue following the meeting, you can do so via the Seattle channel or the listening options that are listed on the agenda. There are uh, 15 people signed up for public comment in order to allow as many speakers as possible to speak. If there are no objections. I will suspend the rules to allow an additional 10 minutes for a total of 30 minutes of public comment. Hearing no objections, public comment has been extended. So we will move right into the speakers. We will start with Howard Gale, followed by Des Chaffon. Howard? Howard, if you've not hit Star six, there you good, go. No, I did, the prompt the prompt was late. Uh, good morning, Howard Gale, District Seven. First agenda item this morning involves a presentation from SPD's, SPD's Crisis Response Unit. Their first PowerPoint states that the Crisis Response Unit's mission is quote to be regarded as an invaluable department resource which safely and appropriately addresses individuals experiencing a present or recent behavioral health crisis, and proficiently navigates the corresponding systems of care to reduce the likelihood of harm, unquote. How did this reduction of harm work for Mike Kwan Yu Chen, Jack Sun Kiwatinawin, Cody Willis Spafford, Larry Andrew Flynn, Sam Tashiro Smith, Shun Ma, Michael L. Taylor, Charlena Lyles, Danny Rodriguez, Ryan Smith, Terry Caver, and then just four months ago, Derek Hayden. They were all suffering a behavioral health crisis while holding a knife or a piece of metal or a broken bottle. All of these people were killed in Seattle by the SPD since of the federal oversight and police reform in less than nine years. These and friends of these people had to suffer not just their loved one's murder, 
but additionally suffer from the fact that they were killed in Seattle, where independent investigations have been and remain impossible. Seattle's police accountability system has deemed all of these killings either lawful and proper or has not even completed or attempted an investigation into these killings. Two weeks ago, State Attorney General Bob Ferguson announced that three Tacoma police officers had been charged in last year's murder of Manny Ellis, charges that were only possible because officials paid attention, they cared, and they performed an independent investigation. These are exactly the things that are not happening in Seattle and appear impossible, given the embrace of the delusion that Seattle has the best accountability system in the country. And today you will discuss another delusion that SBD's crisis response unit actually works. I invite everyone to join Seattle Lights in a city initiative to finally create 100% civilian oversight and investigation of Seattle police by going to seattlestop.org. That is seattlestop.org. Thank you. Our next speaker is Des Chalfant, followed by Julie Buan Bua Buana. Hello. City Council, I am Des Chalfant, and I'm speaking on Decriminalized Nature Seattle. I have been working with them as an avid supporter of entheogen decriminalization set on changing Washington State and United States drug policies, which have been set in place by the war on drugs. Our carceral systems continue to imprison people suffering from a variety of mental health issues and denies access to food, shelter, and health care, leading to self-soothe with substance abuse, and they are criminalized for it. This vicious cycle continues, and our society no longer has a place for prohibi prohibitionary laws. I urge you, council members, to adopt Decriminalized Nature Seattle's resolution swiftly to bring healing to the hearts and minds of Seattle's citizens. And when the momentum moves forward, I hope decriminalization is available across the state of Washington. Some things cannot change, but until you try, you'll never know. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Julie Buana, followed by Shamir Tana. Julie? Hello, my name is Julie Buana, and I am addressing uh, the Crisis Response Unit and General Public Safety. I am here at the Public Safety Committee because I, along with the thousands of other protesters that have been protesting police violence in the past year, feel unsafe. Our BIPOC community members feel unsafe. Our houseless community members feel unsafe. Community members and the LGBTQIA community feel unsafe and community members with disabilities who may suffer mental health crises feel extremely unsafe. Seattle community members feel unsafe because the Seattle Police Department as a whole, the people who are supposed to protect and serve us, actually target and brutalize us. Protesters are sprayed with chemical weapons. BIPOC folk are profiled, harassed, and murdered. Houseless folk are cruelly and inhumanely targeted during sweeps. And folks, folks in the LGBTQIA community are targeted and harassed by SPD, and people with disabilities suffering mental health crises are routinely brutalized, harassed, and killed by SPD. All of this has happened for decades with impunity because the accountability system in Seattle does not work for the community. And these atrocities will continue to happen if we allow the current accountability system to continue. As community members, we must create an accountability system that helps us feel safe an accountability system that is accountable to us. Please go to seattlestop.org to find out how we can create a fully civilianized police oversight board with investigative power and disciplinary authority that helps keep us safe. Again, that's seattlestop.org. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Shamir Tana, followed by Travana Thompson-Wiley. Shamir? Hi, my name is Shamir Tan. I'm a, I'm a resident of District 7. I'm calling a response um, to the criminal legal systems chief plan being presented today. I want to focus on three points. 
Um, first is we need to reduce the footprint of the c- criminal legal system and the way it harmfully impacts people's lives, disproportionately black, indigenous, p- persons of color. For example, we need to stop diverting money from defunding SPD towards an expansion of the city's attorney's office. It violates the spirit of the defund movement. Number two, on, misde- on misdemeanor offenses, we need to focus on increasing access to basic human rights and livelihood, not more interaction with the criminal legal system. And number three, at a meta level, this intervention is guided by a criminal legal systems framework that prioritizes system need, not the need of community members. Services should be made accessible because they are needed for people to survive, heal, and thrive, not because we need to surveil or monitor people. That means upstream solutions for the well-being of poor and vulnerable communities, and not ones that require contact with the criminal legal system. Thank you for the time. Thank you. The next speaker is Trevana Thompson-Wiley, followed by Maddie Bartholomew. Trevana? Hello, my name is Trayvana. I'm a resident of District 2. I'm calling in today in response to the criminal legal system strategic plan. I'm urging you to reduce the footprint of the criminal legal system in the ways that it harmfully impacts people's lives who are disproportionately black, indigenous, people of color, trans, non-binary, and disabled. As a black woman, I have had to deal with the oppressive criminal legal system and the effects are long lasting. The criminal legal system includes the city attorney's office, diverting money from defunding SPD toward an expansion of the city attorney's office to conduct risk uh, assessments violates the spirit of the defund movement. Shrinking the legal, the criminal legal system is the goal and building up community capacity for responding to crisis human needs as the alternative. The nature of the misdemeanor offenses are that they are majority crimes of poverty, such as theft, poverty, and arise from unmet needs. As a young black woman living in Seattle, I have consistently seen poor BIPOC folks jail for crimes of poverty. I have seen a young black mother jail for selling food for her children because she was poor and houseless. Instead of incarceration, that mother needed services. She needed a system that relies on services over incarceration. The system, the the solution is to increase access to basic human rights and livelihood, not to reinforce the same systems that make people vulnerable to begin with. 90% 90% of the misdemeanor population are considered indignant and utilize public defense. It's time to change who we take care of in our community, especially poor BIPOC communities. We have to value, we have to know that all members of our community are valuable. I've seen fathers jailed for driving with a suspended license because they were unable to pay court fees and were the sole breadwinner for their family. The father again needed services over incarceration. I will end by saying that all members of our community should be valued. We need to invest in community-led alternatives that are based in harm reduction and not being thrown in cages. Our investment. Thank you, Trevana. You can send in your comments if um, we didn't get all of them. Our next speaker is Maddie Bartholomew, followed by Ben Sircombe. Maddie? Hi, my name is Maddie Bartholomew. I'm a resident in District 6 here in Seattle. As a concerned constituent of the mental health crisis in the city, I'm asking you all today to enact the Decriminalize Nature Seattle Ordinance to decriminalize psychedelics in Seattle. I myself have a history with addiction. In my late teens, I was pained from childhood trauma that I developed addictive behaviors as coping mechanisms. I was chain smoking cigarettes, I had formed an alcohol dependency, and I had also formed an eating disorder. In my early 20s, I experienced multiple psychedelic therapy sessions where I cultivated the tools to heal from my trauma. Those sessions, along with integration work, has allowed me to overcome most of my addiction. My existence is living proof that psychedelics can be used as tools for healing and self-improvement. Now more than ever, the citizens of this city deserve the opportunity to have access to these tools. Walking in the streets of Seattle, it's clear that mental health and addiction is an issue, and society needs to do better at helping all the people who live here, regardless of income or identity. Please enact this ordinance and allow these alternative solutions to become an accessible reality for those who need it most. Thank you for your time today. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Ben Thurcombe, followed by Jody Thomas. Ben? My name is Ben Circum, and I'm a union organizer and a resident of District 3. I'm speaking today on behalf of Decrim Nature Seattle in the hopes that you will adopt our ordinance and decriminalize psychedelics. Decriminalization means that veterans coming home with crippling PTSD can seek therapies that have proven to be effective at treating the disorder. Decriminalization means that opioid addicts can seek an effective means of over overcoming their addiction when other methods have failed them. Decriminalization means getting rid of outdated drug laws that have only proven to fill jails and ruin lives. Not decriminalizing is telling veterans we are not interested in exploring options and treating their pain and instead would prefer to throw them in jail. Not decriminalizing means that folks with terminal illnesses that want to soothe their pain to make peace with their death have to risk their safety by buying drugs off the street and risking arrest. Not decriminalizing means we can't provide educational resources and community outreach to folks who have been failed by antidepressants and at the pharmaceuticals who want to better themselves. You've heard me speak for several months urging you to decriminalize because psychedelics have healed my anxiety and depression. I would not know where I'd be without that medicine. Let others have that opportunity. We can do better Seattle. I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jody Thomas, followed by Penny O'Grady. Jody? Good morning. My name is Jody Thomas. I'm 56 and the CEO of a small startup. I'm reaching out in support of decriminalizing psychedelics. As a survivor of childhood and domestic violence, I struggled with debilitating fibromyalgia, anxiety, addiction to prescribed meds, and binge alcoholism throughout my adult life. Despite the years of therapy, the pandemic intensified my struggles. Overwhelmed and heading for divorce, I just couldn't go on. Convincing research led me to seek psychedelics. Within two ayahuasca ceremonies, serenity, self-love, and security replaced anxiety. Fibromyalgia, alcohol cravings, and meds are now gone. In six months, I healed a lifetime of wounds, repaired my marriage, and I now live a life of joy and gratitude. These plants, medicines can heal humanity. Just imagine what a healed, emotionally intelligent community can do to solve society's problems. It starts here with us. I urge you to take the lead for Washington State by supporting this movement. The Gather, Gift, and Grow model is the surest way to reach the masses. Many of us are capable of helping our friends and families through their journeys using learned harm reduction methods. Please consider this as you proceed. And thank you so much for your time today. about that. Our next speaker is Penny O'Grady, followed by Nikita Oliver. Good morning, everyone. My name is Penny O'Grady. I'm a white homeowner in District 6. I'm calling in response to the criminal legal system strategic plan being presented today. I stand with the goal of shrinking the criminal legal system and building up community capacity for responding to crisis and human needs as the alternative. I am concerned about the expansion of the city attorney's office to conduct risk assessments. Money diverted from policing to the office of the city attorney keeps us invested in the huge footprint of the criminal legal system. I appreciate the direction of Intercept Zero with its support of participatory budgeting as one example of an alternative that doesn't require contact with the criminal legal system. But unfortunately, the CLS framework overall still prioritizes a system's need rather than the needs of community members. I speak for keeping this emphasis on basic human needs and human dignity. Using terms like crime reduction and Preventing recidivism too easily slide into the thinking that these are the primary motives for offering services to community members rather than centering the basic dignity of human beings and the need for a thriving community. This replicates the logic of the system to criminalize and pathologize impacted individuals before they are deemed deserving of services. Services should be made accessible simply because they are needed for people to survive, heal, and thrive, not out of a need to surveil and monitor. We need far more upstream solutions that reflect the city's responsibility in caring for the well-being of poor and vulnerable communities. 
I urge you to keep working to further reduce the footprint of the criminal legal system in all its forms and the ways that it harmfully impacts people's lives who are disproportionately black, indigenous, and people of color. Thank you. Next speaker is Nikita Oliver, followed by Latanya Severe. Nikita? Good morning, Seattle City Council. My name is Nikita Oliver. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm calling about the criminal legal systems alignment work. I want to first start by saying there are some recommendations in the report that you all will review today that I think are good um, and are in alignment with the community that a few years ago advocated to divest from one of the city's jail contracts. That being said, um, part of our advocacy was to see the footprint of the criminal legal system be shrunk and to be able to address the ways in which that system harms and impacts uh, lives, especially black, indigenous, people of color, queer and trans and disabled community members. The legal system, the criminal legal system includes the city attorney's office and diverting money from defund SPD toward an expansion of the city attorney's office to conduct risk assessments violates the spirit of our movement. We're strongly advocating that actually you shrink the size of the criminal legal system. The nature of misdemeanor offenses are that they're majority crimes of poverty. And the solution is to increase access to basic human rights and livelihood, not to reinforce the same system that's made people vulnerable. According to Seattle Municipal Court data, 90% of misdemeanor folks who are being criminalized as misdemeanors are considered indigent. So the real need here is to increase access to basic need support, and that really will decrease the number of people in the criminal legal system. I hope that at some point we get to hear from the community members that were a part of the CLS task force, because I know that they have their own recommendations, and hope that they have the opportunity in this same public format to share their thoughts and their wisdom with the council. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Latanya Severe, followed by Connor Waters. Tanya, Latanya. Uh, good morning. My name is Latanya Severe. I'm a 39-year-old Black queer non-binary person renting in D2. Um, I'm also the co-lead of the Black Brilliance Research Project, which worked with over 100 community researchers who were primarily Black and Brown. This research included the voices of thousands of community members to design a Black and community-led participatory budgeting process. I'm calling in to respond to the criminal legal system strategic plan being presented today. While I appreciate seeing the Black Brilliance Research Project and participatory budgeting mentioned in this report, investing more money into the city attorney's office is at odds with the recommendations coming out of the research. Uh, city council should be reducing the footprint of the criminal punishment system and the ways that it is harmful, harmfully impacting people's lives disproportionately by POC folks. Uh, Deficit-based models lack a trauma-informed lens. We need genu genuine trauma-informed interventions that support our communities to thrive. Trauma-informed approach assumes that nobody is inherently violent or abusive. We have all been tra traumatized by our surroundings and learned to cope in whatever ways we could. Some of these traumas resp trauma responses have developed into patterns of behavior that may cause further harm to others around us. Being trauma-informed means we look at each other's at each other each person's struggles through a trauma lens, which is distinct from judgmental punitive models that considers harmful actions of individuals at the failures of their character that need to be corrected with punishment. From a public health perspective, the metrics that are utilized by the risk needs responsivity model are def deficit based. They are called cr criminogenic risk factors. Focusing on participants prior interactions with the system to define their ability to access needs. It lacks a trauma informed lens. They are not strength or asset based criteria, which recognize, draw from and strengthen an individual's resources and capacity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Connor Waters, followed by Valerie Schollerett. Connor? Good morning. My name is Connor Waters, and I live in District 6. I'll be commenting on the resolution to decriminalize NPGENs in Seattle. 
and I'm speaking as a naturopathic medical student and a soon-to-be naturopathic doctor. I also have a training as an EMT and I've worked 911 in Seattle, as well as training in medical applications of psychedelic therapies. As part of the Decriminalized Nature Seattle group, I'm hoping that you will sign the letter to the OIER task force in support of our ordinance to decriminalize psychedelics in Seattle. I frequently work with patients who have anxiety and depression, and I have experienced both conditions myself. I know anecdotally from my patients and from my own life experience that psychedelic therapies can help to produce a lift in mood when used in a reasonable manner and in a safe environment. These effects can have a duration of weeks to months. I know from my medical training that this has grounding in the research that has been performed by Johns Hopkins Medical School and the Royal College of London around both anxiety and depression as well as end-of-life care. A notable study by Johns Hopkins in 2019 found that two dosing sessions of psilocybin paired with a series of psychotherapy improved significant uh, measures in depression scores. I also know from my experience in healthcare and emergency medicine that Seattle suffers from suicide rates far and above other major metropolitan centers in the USA. Seasonal affective disorder contributes significantly to a sense of gloom in many Seattle residents. I speculate that access to psychedelic medicines without fear of legal repercussions could empower citizens to be proactive in their health care. An increasing number of clinicians are becoming trained in how to guide their patients in safe use, and this could revolutionize outcomes in mental health care. So I am asking the Seattle City Council to make a bold and affirming statement for the health of its constituents by supporting decriminalization of psychedelics in Seattle. It is time for reason and science to guide our drug policy in a manner that reduces harm and opens up new options for health care. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Valerie Schlorette, uh, followed by Bill Roberts. Valerie? Hi. Hi. Uh, good morning, council members. <clears throat> I'm Valerie Schlorette from District 2. <clears throat> I'll be very interested to hear the discussion about SPD and crisis response today, but I suspect it will omit mention of the many people in mental health crisis who were killed by SPD. The shooting of Derek Hayden on the waterfront in February is one example of a crisis incident that could have been handled very differently. Uh, and if it had been, it would have saved a life. The PowerPoint attached to today's agenda, the uh, PowerPoint that will accompany today's presentation, seems very aspirational and not at all based in the reality of what is happening when police are called to respond to people in crisis. To be honest, that disconnect makes me feel a bit physically sick. Um, I know from experience that our current system of crisis response to people in mental health uh, crisis is woefully inadequate and increases harm. Um, that's my family experience, and thinking about it this morning has really made me feel quite ill. To understand what has been happening when SPD encounters people in mental health crisis, we need a system of real police accountability to shine a light on that pattern and practice. Go to seattlestop.org for more information about how we can make that happen. Thank you. Our next speaker, Bill Roberts, is showing as not present. So we'll go down to Elena Lessing. Elena? Hello, my name is Ilana Lessing and I am calling in both to address the, the presentation about the crisis response, but also specifically to address, to address the Seattle Fire Department Police Chief. I would like to know, where are your text messages? You were one of the several, including the Seattle Police Chief and the um, Mayor Durkin who deleted your text. How can we trust anything you say in a meeting like this when you've repeatedly and consistently shown to delete text during some of the most critical moments in our last year's safety? In addition, mm -hmm. I would also like to say that the Seattle, uh, Seattle Fire Department is incredibly complicit with Seattle Police Department's bad response for mental health issues. The amount of times that fire declines to respond to someone experiencing someone unconscious or someone experiencing a drug issue has directly led to part of the, the reason people don't trust calling 911. Um, it's, it's really critical and that it leads to the death of people, the death of people like Aaron, Derek Aaron. Finally, I would like to stand in solidarity for everyone calling in about the critical criminal legal system plan and um, transferring money to the Seattle City Attorney's Office and with Decrim Seattle. Thank you. 
Thank you. And our last speaker who is indicating as present is uh, a person who is signed in as Miriam with no last name. Miriam. Hi, my name is Miriam. I'm a resident resident of District 6, and I'm calling today to urge you to reduce the footprint of SVD, uh, not only in our city in general, but specifically when approaching community members in crisis. Um, the PowerPoint that is currently listed on the agenda is great in nature. Uh, that will never, ever, ever happen. Uh, we need to focus on community ro uh, resources when we're approaching mental health concerns. Um, and it should absolutely not be going through a violent and racist police department. Um, there are a absurd amount of documented cases and through the OPA, through just general population, we are where we are well aware that we're, that the Seattle Police Department is not able to handle these situations. Not even three months ago, they murdered Derek Hayden, who is experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, our officers are not trained. Uh, they are not the ones who should be responding to these crises. Um, additionally, uh, we do have the fire chief on the agenda today and would love to know what happened to those text messages. No one in this county trusts you anymore. Uh, hold yourself accountable. Tell the truth. Uh, abolish SPD. I yield the rest of my time. Okay, with that, we conclude today's public comment, and we will move into the items on the agenda. Um, as mentioned, the first item on the agenda is um, a crisis response continuum roundtable. We are joined by Fire Chief Harold Scoggins and um, John Ehrenfeld from uh, the Fire Department's Health One. Um, we are also joined by Lieutenant Eric Piskonski with the Seattle Police Department, uh, heading up the crisis uh, response unit of the police department. This is a separate unit from the rest of SPD. We'll hear more about that. We'll hear from each uh, Neil Olson, Nicole Davis, and Michelle McDaniel from Crisis Connections, Sarah Dearborn with the Public Defender Association, Brandy Flood with REACH, and Maggie Hosnick with the Downtown Emergency Service Center's uh, mobile uh, response team. And um, we're also joined, of course, by Amy Gore uh, with our council central staff. I'm just gonna um, make a few opening remarks and then I'm gonna hand it over uh, to central staff. Um, so folks understand um, the, viewing, the viewing public, everybody who is part of the existing crisis response continuum as we're hearing about today, this is our existing continuum, um, has been asked to answer uh, a couple questions. Uh, one, what do you do best and who do you serve best? What we are seeking to do is we're seeking to have a discussion about our current crisis continuum so we can learn more about the gaps within that continuum and continue the council's work uh, to, to address those gaps. I'm going to, in my opening remarks, um, uh, draw liberally from uh, a October 20th um, article from the Center for American Progress on the community responder model. This article explains that in cities all over the US, police have been made responsible for much more than simply enforcing the law. Increasingly, they're expected to solve every problem that crops up in the community, from resolving noise complaints and reversing overdoses, to disciplining school children and de-escalating behavioral health crises. Yet these calls from services or services can result in unnecessary uses of force, justice system involvement, and other adverse outcomes for civilians, as well as put a strain on public safety resources. The harmful effects from these interactions have not been felt equally by all. Communities of color have disproportionately experienced heavy police presence, high rates of arrest, and harsh enforcement. The growth of policing has also negatively affected people with behavioral health disorders and disabilities whose medical conditions are too often treated like a crime. According to the International Associations of Chiefs of Police, 
the, they say the mere presence of a law enforcement vehicle, an officer in uniform and or a weapon has the potential to escalate a situation when a person is in crisis. This ever expanding role of the police has had a negative impact on officers themselves, many of whom have attested to having too much on their plate. Um, a quote from a uh, retired Major Neil Franklin, who served as the head of training for Baltimore Police Department, is like um, quotes that I've offered from, from other, other police officers um, in the past. This one says, every time 911 receives a call, it's currently the job of police to respond. But many calls don't involve a crime, and when they do, many of those crimes are minor and related to quality of life issues such as homelessness, mental health disorders, or substance misuse. We need to stop expecting police to do social work and start sending the right trained professionals to address low-level crimes and non-criminal calls for service. The Beer Institute of Justice conducted an in-depth analysis of 911 data from five cities, including Seattle, and found that non-emergency incidents nationwide were the most frequent type of call for service to 911. The share of low priority, non-urgent calls was 45% in Seattle. Meanwhile, medium priority, non-life-threatening non -life incidents comprised 36% in Seattle. Top priority, life-threatening emergencies made up the small, smallest portion of 911 calls in Seattle, only 18%. So relying on police to handle low-level calls for service not only has the consequences um, that I uh, named earlier, but it also um, can result in negative police interactions that not only affect residents' health and well-being, but can also erode public trust in policing. Loss of trust can have serious ramifications for public safety, including a reduction in the likelihood that residents will report crime to law enforcement, making it harder for officers to prevent and solve crimes. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Council Central staff who can talk a little bit about um, the council actions that we've taken thus far that has sort of created the foundation uh, for this discussion as well as um, some other work that the council has been doing. Thank you. Good morning, council members, and thank you, Chair Herbold, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Amy Gore from Council Central Staff. My colleague, Greg Doss, is also with us this morning. We have a brief presentation to provide background and context for the roundtable today. I know that council members are um, eager to hear from the panelists, so I'm going to go through these slides very quickly, but we are happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, next slide, please, Greg. We thought it would be helpful to ground today's discussion in some of the recent actions Council has taken related to scaling up alternatives to armed police response. As you recall, in August of 2020, Council passed Resolution 31962, which was based on the 2020 Blueprint for Police Dis Divestment and Community Reinvestment from Decriminalized Seattle and King County Equity Now. The resolution outlined several actions that um, Council intended pers to pursue, including um, creating a new civilian-led department with a broader approach to public safety, requesting that the Chief of P Police undertake a 911 call analysis, um, working to determine enforcement practices that should be deprioritized based on their disproportionate impacts on BIPOC communities. Shortly thereafter, the mayor issued Executive Order 202010, which included additional steps to analyze and develop alternatives to our current police response system. Next slide, please, Greg. In addition to the resolution, Council has taken a number of budgetary actions recently to expand the city's non-SPD response. For example, as part of the 2020 budget revisions, Council authorized non-SPD referrals to lead, funded a visioning process for community-based organizations involved in non-SPD response, requested a SPD civilianization report, um, and also funded the Seattle Community Safety Initiative with $4 million and, dollars and an additional $12 million for capacity building for community organizations focused on alternative approaches to public safety. 
In the 2021 budget, council provided funding for the expansion of Health One, made investments in crisis connections and critical incident community responders, as well as an expansion of the DESC mobile crisis team. Um, the budget also created the new Safe and Thriving Communities Division at HSD and included over $28 million for participatory budgeting and $29.9 million for investments recommended by the Equitable Communities Initiative Task Force, which we've just started hearing about um, at the end of last week, I believe. Next slide, please, Greg. There are several efforts underway at the city to build off of these actions and investments and prepare for the next steps. For example, the Seattle Police Department, the Office of Inspector General, and the Seattle Fire Department are all working on analyzing 911 call data to better understand the demand for services to determine what types of responses are needed and at what scale. In addition, Council has undertaken the Criminal Legal System Realignment Project, which you will hear more about later in this meeting. Um, the Council continues to work with stakeholders, particularly community partners, through the Criminal Legal Realignment Task Force and through the What Works Cities Alternative Emergency Response Sprint, which, as you are aware, was an opportunity for many folks, both city staff and community partners, to learn more about non-police response models being used in communities around the country. And um, also, we've been working on debriefing debriefing from the Sprint meetings um, through debriefs from council member um, Herbold and Lu council members Herbold and Lewis. In addition, there's an executive working group which meets weekly to discuss these various initiatives and provide coordination and data support. Next slide, please, Greg. Um, as these efforts conclude, the next steps um, are to review and examine the 911 call analyses that are currently underway. Um, the second, to determine demand for calls that could be diverted to an unarmed response, um, to identify gaps within the current service continuum, um, and examine potential labor implications of alternative responses. Um, all of this will hopefully lead to coordinated investments in alternatives and the development of operational protocols needed to support the continuum of services. Next slide, please. Um, more specifically, next steps for Council include a presentation from the Executive Work Group on the data analysis currently underway and recommendations made pursuant to Executive Order 202010. Greg and I are also preparing a memo on these various components, including the data analysis, the gaps analysis, and potential investments for Council to consider. Our goal is that this be presented to the committee later in the summer so that council members will, ha will have this information as they are preparing to make investment decisions as part of the 2022 budget. Um, that concludes our brief overview, but we're happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm just going to pause here to see if council members have any questions. Um, and if not, we'll move into the discussion. We're going to hear first from Lee. I'm sorry, first from DESC, then we'll hear from LEAD, then we'll hear from the Crisis Response Unit and Health One, and then we'll wrap up with Crisis Connections. Um, at the beginning, I mentioned what the what the two questions are that. Um, we've been asking folks to focus on. Um, what gaps do you see in the, um, uh, sorry, uh, what is your role in the crisis response continuum? What do you do best and who do you serve best? And then um, from, from your perspective, what gaps do you see in the crisis response continuum? We'll hear, um, we'll hear a go around on the first question. Uh, what is your role in the crisis response continuum? What do you do best and who do you serve best? And then we'll go around again and we'll answer the second question. Um, I wanna just say that for my participation in the What Works Sprint um, effort that uh, many folks from the council and the executive and community members have been uh, been um, participating in, um, an issue that really comes to four for me um, that um, our friends at um, REACH and um, LEAD have been uh, really doing a good job of bringing to the forefront is the concern that um, a 911 triggered system um, that has some armed response and some non-armed response uh, concern that even uh, that type of a system that an armed response will still be sent 
um, disproportionately to people of color. Similarly, there's the concern that if we have a system outside of 911, um, that people um, will call for the non-armed response uh, for people in mental health crisis or other non-criminal needs, um, disproportionately benefiting um, people who are not uh, people of color. And so that is really, for me, um, a question that we need to have another conversation about, but I know is going to come up in the thread um, through, uh, through the presentations today. So um, let's kick it off. Um, and um, when you answer sort of that first question, if you can just be sure that you um, state your name and, um, and your organization, that would be great. So um, question number one, uh, what is your role in the crisis response continuum? What do you do best and who do you serve best? I hand it off to Maggie. Thanks, Lisa. Um, who do we serve? We serve folks that are in crisis. Um, I think it's important to define what crisis is um, versus uh, emer behavioral health emergency. Um, so behavioral health crisis is a turning point of a condition or a situation somebody is in. Um, a time when uh, a different or important decision um, must be made. So we um, serve everybody in King County through the mobile crisis team. Um, and we work in coordination with law enforcement um, as our referent fire um, designated crisis responders, which are folks that can take people's rights away and put them in the hospital. Um, and then also our um, uh, crisis connections um, uh, get uh, referrals from individuals in the community. Thank you, Maggie. Moving on to um, the second uh, presenter for asking, uh, answering that first question, we'll have uh, Sarah Deer Dearborn and Brandy Flood uh, from Lee and Marie. Good morning and thank you. My name is Tiara Dearborn and I'm a lead project manager with Public Defender Association. Um, there's a couple points I'd like to make here about our role in this. Um, since the proviso being passed for community referrals, we have been the response for many of these low level law violation concerns. Um, and so we really have been uh, putting in the effort to work collaboratively with businesses, with other social service providers, with community members to make referrals directly to the program um, for things like substance use, um, sex work, low level theft, those sorts of things, um, definitely poverty crimes that um, should have an alternative response. Um, we would love to continue doing this work if capacity allows. Um, it has been extremely important and connecting people to those resources prevents the um, prevents people from eventually entering crisis. If they have somebody who is supportive of them, they're receiving the services needed to meet their basic needs um, and preventing the need to engage in law violations in order to survive. Um, another important role here is the collaboration with all the other agencies here. Um, it's important that we, um, we really see ourselves in the like pre and post crisis. It's also extremely important that people are connected immediately into long-term care that will follow an individual um, providing the care that they actually need um, to meet basic needs um, uh, and to address those, that sort of behavior without using the criminal legal system. Um, and uh, I will, I'm going to pass it to Brandy to talk about what we do best and who we serve, because really that is the role that as the uh, service provider for the individuals we serve, that is the role that she's in charge of. Thanks, Tier. Yeah. Um, my name is Brandy Flood. I'm the Director of Community Justice for REACH, and we manage the clinical side of the lead contract, working with the case managers, providing long-term um, intensive case management to the clients we serve. And so when I think about my role, uh, my role is to show up for individuals with a wide range of behavioral health issues that are in the intersection of crime um, there for those folks. And so what we do best is we serve people 
with significant trauma. Um, uh, people of color, particularly black folks, um, unhoused people, people using substances, and people who, just because of their trauma and making crimes of um, poverty and substance use, we show up at that intersection for them because even with the alternative line, um, police will still be called on for these people just by the point of view and the bias of the caller um, and the fact that a crime is happening. I think um, uh, Ms. Trevana Thompson said it best, you know, when the woman who showed up um, stealing for food, um, although it's a crime of poverty and it shouldn't even be a crime, it's still a crime. So police are going to show up in that incident. Um, what we do best um, is, is show up for those folks and serve them long term. And so everything from um, connecting people back to family, helping people navigate through the criminal legal system. Um, you know, I know that we shouldn't even have the criminal legal system, but at the same time, I can't leave those people behind as they're trying to remove that barrier, which can be very difficult to do when you have significant trauma, diagnosed mental health. You know, you're living outside, it's hard to navigate through that. We're helping connect people through housing. Um, our housing system in King County, it's not great. Um, there are really no options, but we work hard to make those connections and work through those internal systems to get people housed, people who've never had housing before, connect to treatment, connect to more robust services, because if we had robust services to meet the needs of folks, we might have less incidents of um, crime in our communities, and we would have less police surveillance and police power in our communities if we could provide robust services to our community. Thank you so much. Next in our lineup, we're going to hear uh, from uh, Lieutenant uh, Eric Viskonski with the Seattle Police Department, the Crisis Response Unit. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I think when you talk about what is what is our role in the crisis continuum, um, I, I think all three that spoke previously uh, kind of defined what our role is. Right? We are. We are the, the 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 safety net, the catch-all. The there aren't those resources that people can directly connect with, um, and so the default becomes nine one one, and that is that is kind of our role. And as nine one one, we don't have the option to not go. Right when someone calls nine one one, we have to respond, even if at the heart of the matter, it's something where we inherently know, hey, this is not a police engagement response right this is not a crime or it's or it's such a low level or you know has been pointed out it's a crime of poverty um you know what what is the action that we're going to take and and we have to respond regardless so our role is certainly within the crisis response unit and and council member as you had pointed out we are um we are a specialty unit within the police department so there's kind of two different conversations there of what is the overall 911 response um, you know, when someone calls and patrol officers are, are going to respond to a call versus the crisis response unit specifically, um, in, in our role, in our capacity, it is really to uh, try and take that holistic approach, try and come in, stabilize, uh, you know, an acute situation, and then make those referrals to our community partners and stakeholders um, for the most appropriate services and, and follow up. Um, not looking for, you know, necessarily a criminal approach to it or a law enforcement uh, approach to it, but really redirecting folks back to the more appropriate community-based services that are out there. Um, that that's definitely our our role and our mission as a unit, uh, broader within the police department, and we try and base all of our training that we've done uh, over the past few years of really amplifying what the community resources are that are out there uh, and, and understanding what our role is of, you know, again, kind of that default, people call 911, but we are not case managers. We are not long-term care providers. We are not, um, you know, acute care providers for some of, some of the individuals that are experiencing a variety of those behavioral health issues. Uh, which could be mental health or substance abuse or anything along that spectrum. Uh, and, and really trying to leverage these services that are in the community, whether they're city-based or county-based, uh, and go from there. So that is, that's kind of our role and what we're looking at, um, I guess, to what do we do best and, and who do we serve best. Uh, again, as the crisis response unit, our goal is really to focus on those individuals that are maybe the disproportionate utilizers of those 911 services 
uh, to, to again, see if we can redirect them back to the most appropriate services and more importantly, reduce the number of patrol responses that might be going out, right? So if that 911 call comes in, if we can, if we can reduce the number of 911 calls that are associated with an individual, um, it doesn't matter why they came in, but if we can reduce those, the patrol is not responding out to those, and those individuals are better engaged with those services, that's our number one priority, along with those that are presenting an imminent likelihood of harm. Uh, and that's, that's really our focus, especially as the crisis response unit is, you know, if you have that individual that is actively suicidal, that is, you know, actively putting themselves in a state of harm, how can we interdict that, try and stabilize that situation, and then again, connect that individual back to the most appropriate resources? Lieutenant, can you just talk a little bit about um, how, um, and the, I, I apologize the way we've laid out these two questions, it may not feel conducive to showing your slides. I know Maggie, you had a slide and Lieutenant, you had some slides as well. Um, but I know there's, um, for uh, a couple programs uh, for both the crisis response unit as well as the mobile crisis team, the, um, the department uh, pairs um, with mental health providers uh, from, from DESC um, in the instance of the crisis response unit, I believe. And then there's also um, um, a, a, a requirement currently for the mobile crisis teams um, to, um, to be um, dispatched through, through law enforcement. So if you could maybe just touch a little bit on that, that would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we are we are very unique uh, here and in, in Seattle and with our unit, our crisis response unit, we follow what's referred to as a co-responder model. Uh, and that's how we deploy. So that is taking a mental health professional and putting them in a car with a trained, especially trained police officer. Uh, and we're able to respond out to both in progress calls to, again, be a patrol resource. Um, and support of that because the volume of crisis calls, if you will, that, that come through the city of Seattle and come through the department uh, are around about 10,000 a year. And so our, our small niche group cannot possibly respond to every single one of those calls. But we go out and we try and respond uh, to assist patrol with a mental health professional and a police officer. And then the other side of that would be all of those reports that get written come through our unit. And then we do the triage in conjunction with those MHPs uh, to be able to determine, is there some value added? Is there some additional follow-up that we might be able to provide? Reaching out to case managers or service providers um, and, and making a, a warm handoff of, you know, hey, one of your clients had some interactions over the weekend or over the last week. Um, might want to see if we can get them back in, uh, maybe re-engage them with those services. So we're we're trying to handle both ends of that of that equation uh, within our unit, and then yes, with you know the the ability of mobile crisis team, um, it is a tremendous resource that we have at our disposal. It's countywide, uh, but we are also spoiled with Seattle being the seat of King County that they are based just down the street, uh, and they're they're right here local for us. So we have had a very strong relationship uh, with with Maggie and her group and DESC in general. Uh, who oversees the crisis response, or I mean, I'm sorry, the mobile crisis team and the crisis solution center uh, and the crisis diversion facility that we're able to make those direct referrals in the field. Any officer can make a direct referral in the field to uh, the mobile crisis team and have them respond out to a call that an officer does not need to actually wait around for. So if an officer responds to a situation, determines there's some type of, again, broad term crisis issue that's going on. There's no real law enforcement role here. Um, officers can make that call directly from the field to mobile crisis team uh, to the tune of, you know, we're in the five, 600 a year that officers are making those direct referrals to mobile crisis team. Uh, and then folks from Maggie's team can respond out directly to the field and then connect them with a whole plethora of services that that are available and we completely remove the law enforcement aspect of it, which is 
which is a great option. So, and in addition, um, with those five MHPs, so we have five mental health professionals and five full-time officers, and then a sergeant that oversees that group. Um, those mental health professionals are currently contracted through DESC, uh, and that contract is actually managed by Human Services Division. Uh, so they're, there's a firewalling there between the police department and our MHPs so that they, um, they have their own reporting. They, they are employees of DESC, and that's just a contracted spot, which, again, thank you to the city council um, for approving that funding uh, uh, a couple of years ago now, a year and a half ago now. So that expanded us up to those five MHPs. Thank you. Um, and before we move on, uh, Maggie, did you have anything that you wanted to add here? Yeah, thank you for the second opportunity here. Um, so our mobile crisis team, like Eric said, are comprised of uh, mental health professionals. And once we get that phone call from a fire, police, DCRs, or crisis connections, we send out um, these mental health professionals to assess for risk. Um, and risk is what we consider emergency where somebody is not able to care for themselves or make decisions or are a threat to themselves or the community. Um, often in these cases, we will refer, we will work in coordination with the police um, and get them to the hospital where they can be assessed by our designated uh, crisis responders. But often when mobile crisis team does respond, we are seeing folks that, um, you know, are in the crisis, are needing to make a different decision in that moment. And these um, mental health professionals are able to uh, provide resources, talk with people, get them to a higher level of care if needed, which uh, Eric had referred to the crisis diversion facility, which is a 72 hour stabilization program. Um, but mostly what they what the mobile crisis team does is move the individual away from the formal institution of policing and fire uh, DCRs and into the hands over time um, to other outreach agencies or agencies that can provide that long term case management connection back to community um, family, um, etc. Thank you, Maggie. And um, before I move on, I just want to make a finer point at it, on it. And correct me if I'm wrong. The um, the, the the DESC uh, mobile response team um, is focused on um, a law enforcement referral where there is not a need for a law enforcement response. Whereas the crisis response unit is. Uh, focused on bringing um, behavioral health experts to instances where there is uh, a perceived threat to self or others. Um, and we've, we heard folks in, um, in public comment re refer to the unfortunate um, death of Derek Hayden at the hands of police officers. That was not a crisis response unit response. Um, some of those officers may have crisis response training. Um, SPD works hard to ensure that its officers have um, crisis training, but that was not a crisis response unit training. And if we had, again, this is this this exercise today is about is about our continuum and where there are gaps. Um, and I know that there are um, folks in the community, we, we recently heard from um, uh, uh, Mothers for, for Police Accountability who have a lot of concern that our crisis, our, our crisis response unit run out of SPD to respond to people in mental health crisis with uh, behavioral health uh, expertise, um, that that unit um, has, is not functioning in the way envisioned because of um, the staffing shortfalls that SPD is experiencing right now. So just um, want to highlight that um, when we talk about a continuum, we're talking about a continuum that responds to people across a number of different needs um, and our efforts to try to try to get that right. So needs are not uh, do not go unmet or, or are not met with the wrong response. And I'm just looking to see if there are any questions from my colleagues. If not, we'll move on to Health One. Goggins and John. 
Good morning, Council Member. Thank you very much for inviting us and for the opportunity to be here. Um, my name is John Ehrenfeld. I'm the Program Manager for Mobile Integrated Health within the Seattle Fire Department, which is a partnership also with the Human Services Department here in Seattle. Um, and so I oversee our MIH program, which includes our Health One team. Uh, Health One is a uh, multidisciplinary team that we field uh, based out of the fire department that uh, staffs two weekday units with uh, specially trained firefighters and a human services department case managers. Um, we take uh, responses in a number of ways. We are directly dispatched by the 911 center, primarily on uh, minor injury falls, lift assists and welfare checks. Um, so more, more medical in those nature. Um, we respond to requests from our operations in the field when they identify the need for a alternative response that's not a traditional police or fire um, uh, disposition. And then we also do quite a bit of uh, proactive outreach and follow up with established clients. Um, there's sort of three general categories that our clients fall into uh, in health. One, uh, one is uh, people who are aging in place. The other is people in some manner of uh, behavioral health or substance abuse crisis. Um, and the third is people suffering from the social consequences of homelessness or extreme poverty. And obviously, these are all very much overlapping categories. Um, we are, um, as far as behavioral crisis response, we um, primarily focus on sort of the lower to mid tier of these crises. So we're not able by virtue of our staffing to um, intervene in people who are violent or potentially violent, um, psychotic or unable to engage. Typically those we would let um, one of the police units take the lead, but we do see a huge amount of sort of lower level behavioral crisis crisis, um, substance abuse and intoxication, general suicidality, depression, anxiety, um, and, and sort of everything on that continuum. Um, and really, I, I think what we do well is um, act um, sort of like Lieutenant Viscosky get as, as referrers and connectors with other resources. Um, one of the things that we try to emphasize is that, you know, the, when people are encountered with crisis in the field, um, they're, they're, these are extremely complex cases, and it's exceedingly rare for these instances to be resolved, for lack of a better word, um, via a single uh, encounter, whether that's with, you know, police, fire, or a community group. Uh, these individuals typically need a fair amount of, um, of follow-up and ongoing referral, and so we were able to do short-term case management um, and, you know, make referrals to community partners, such as Crisis Connections, LEAD, REACH, uh, the Washington State uh, Long-Term Care System, um, DESC's host team, supportive housing, homelessness services, et cetera. So we act as a sort of a bridge and a facilitator. Um, we are nominally citywide, but we have a particular emphasis on um, communities that have a particular need by virtue of being under-resourced, underrepresented, or having a very high call volume and respond to all of our clients in the field um, with a compassionate, non-judgmental, and particularly trauma-informed lens. Um, and, and we really see ourselves, I think, as, again, sort of that bridge between that initial moment of crisis that often begins with a 911 call um, and, and a bridge to other um, services. Unlike traditional EMS, we are extremely open-ended in our um, our capacity. So, you know, we don't have to take people to the hospital. We don't have to take them to particular clinics. And each and every call, our crew is able to talk to the, the client and sort of collaboratively come up with the best solution, whether that's taking them to the crisis solution center or back home or to a clinic or, you know, referring them to the lead program. Um, so the crew is really capacitated to do a lot of um, very open-ended problem solving um, each time. Um, so with that, I will... Um, I'll turn it over for any questions that you might have, and uh, thank you again. Thank you, John. Uh, much like your uh, the focus of Health One, not just on crisis response, but also in, in follow up. I want to flag um, that DESC also has um, a program um, that has been funded um, by the council. Um, I believe it's it's a it's a pilot at this point. It's a behavioral response team um, that. Um, uh, has both a, a triage and hot phone number, uh, hot line number, um, and they work on uh, not just responding to crisis, but doing the post-crisis work to create linkages in the community, uh, build long-term relationships to get housing, behavioral health treatment, inpatient um, uh, assistance, and case management. So just want to, wanting to flag um, as well that we have um, in the continuum, um, a, a, a city response that is focused on, on crisis response and follow-up as well as an external to the city um, response as well. 
I believe, um, Brandy, you had a, had a question or a comment? I just have one comment. I just wanted to, you know, definitely state that, you know, Lee, we had the same concerns the community has about uh, crisis response. And so for us uh, this year, more than 80% of our referrals came from the community and community members who said, you know, these people are committing crimes, but we don't want to call the police because we don't know what's going to happen. And so we've had a lot of co communities across the city that have called us in to do our own um, going and serve people before police are contacted um, because they have those same concerns. And so the whole year we really have, we've gotten maybe two police referrals in a year, but majority of our referrals come from um, communities and we don't go into the community to serve the folks with law enforcement. We just go with our outreach workers to do the work is a lot of times we already know the people through our homeless services work anyway. Thank you, Brandy, so much. Um, you know, as a, as a council member, I'm also receiving a lot of inquiries from people who don't want to call 911 and they want an alternative. And I am in segue, uh, increasingly referring people to, to crisis connections. Um, and so with that, we'll um, turn over to our team at Crisis Connect Connections um, to talk um, a little bit about the, the question of, of what your role is and what you do best and um, who you serve best. Thank you. Um, so I'm Neil Olson, I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Operations for Crisis Connections. Um, crisis Connections does quite a bit in relation to crisis. We operate at a state level. We have lines and services that are you know, across Washington State, such as our warm line for folks who are lonely, depressed, isolated. Um, our Teen Link line is, is statewide for, for teens who are in crisis or who need emotional support. That operates with chat, it operates with text, it operates with phone calls. Um, that's you know staffed by teens who have lived experience or teens who are concerned. Um, we also offer the Washington State Recovery Helpline, which is for folks with you know addictions who are looking for resources for detox. Um, they're having trouble with problem gambling. Um, but as far as crisis specific intervention, it, for the purpose of this conversation, we have been in operation since 1964 as the regional crisis hotline. Um, crisis connections kind of operates like the, the center of the, the crisis web. We get calls from law enforcement looking for information. We get calls from community members, um, you know, concerned about their brother, or their sister, or their loved one. We get calls from folks who are, you know, wanting to speak to a trained volunteer. We get calls from professionals in the field, from hospitals, um, from ERs, um, just anyone and everyone. We get contacts from kind of the entire continuum of care. Um, we operate that can, you know, that hub model with uh, a really robust volunteer model. Um, so Crisis Connections right now has about 330 trained um, volunteers who are community members who, you know, live and work and eat and sleep in the city of Seattle. And they come in and they volunteer their time on the crisis line. And that's under the supervision of a master's level clinician. Um, our goal is always to resolve crisis at the lowest level possible. Um, you know, we don't want people um, to have to have you know, negative interactions with law enforcement. We don't also want to clog up the law enforcement system. Um, the vast majority of our calls are handled, you know, on the phone with a trained volunteer. Um, there's no police dispatch. There's no mobile crisis team dispatch. Um, we're handling those calls with compassion and emotional support. Um, so I looked at the data this morning. Last month alone for the King County line, we handled nearly 8,000 calls. Our average response time for that was about eight seconds. Um, you know, we have a 0% abandonment rate. We are here, we're here 24 seven. We want those calls, we wanna to speak to those folks. We are the alternative to, you know, a police response. We are the alternative to an armed um, response. Um, and we also have the ability to triage these calls to the appropriate level of care. Whether that is, you know, let's get this person to ER. Let's get an ambulance out there. Let's get a mobile crisis team out there. Let's get a law enforcement co-response out there. Hey, let's get this person a next day appointment. Let's get this person a safety plan that involves their friends, their family members. Um, so we operate up and down um, that, that response system. Um, we take a prevention approach. We do quite a bit of prevention work at Crisis Connections so that folks don't end up in crisis. We do postvention as well. We do survivors of suicide support groups. We do grief and loss boxes for folks who've survived suicide. Um, we're, we're knee deep in crisis and we wanna serve these folks. Um, please divert them to us. We want them, we wanna to talk to them and we wanna help them. And I'll let Nicole maybe speak a little bit deeper into the crisis services department. She um, does a lot more of the day-to-day -day operations. 
So I'm Nicole Davis. I'm the Director of Crisis Services. So I run the Crisis Lines. Um, we really are a hub of information for providers and, and, and linkage. And we have connections into the system to understand um, more of what's going on with our community members if they have a history of um, behavioral health treatment in King County. And we can, um, if somebody's enrolled, we get them connected to their current providers. Um, we can have, you know, connect police and, and mobile crisis team to their current providers for for more um, continuation of care, a better response by people who know them. So we have strong relationships with the des designated crisis respond responders and the mobile crisis team. We um, manage the linkage for them um, across across the state um, and strongly in King County for many, many years. So um, we also have had the opportunity to, um, over the last year and a half, have a pilot project called One Call, um, which is for first responders to be able to call and get that direct access to um, the relevant information if somebody's been in uh, the mental health system before. Um, it's also answered 24 hours a day by a mental health clinician. So we also um, offer consultation and problem solving and suggestions on on how first responders could potentially um, uh, have a different additional information as, as they are facing somebody in the community who's experiencing a behavioral health crisis. So um, yeah, it's a, a really um, great system with our volunteers who come in just energized and ready to offer our callers um, emotional support and and closely monitored and managed by um, a set of really committed staff to making sure that everybody gets linked and connected to the services that they um, are needing. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so let's uh, do a, another round um, of um, of discussion around the the second question we have here um just opening it up to ask uh what gaps you see in the crisis response continuum whether or not there are populations that are not well served uh what racial equity concerns folks have gaps in scale um education uh issues that need to be resolved um coordination dispatch or or anything else that i may not may not have flagged here as as um as a, as a gap that we need to work together to uh to address we can start again uh with maggie thank you so in our continuum we see people on their worst day of their lives um and uh get them to you know where they need to go and we move them down the continuum of crisis into outreach um and what well, one of the major gaps is coordination between this system, um, making sure that we're all coordinating our services and we're doing soft handoffs, that kind of thing. So that is a great need. Um, the other is making sure that individuals, um, BIPOC individuals um, in particular, are getting to their communities, um, that they're being served by people that look like them, that um, value their culture and their beliefs. Um, and uh, we certainly do not have enough um, programs to serve everybody that hits the crisis system. Um, the, between the mobile crisis team and crisis diversion facility, we see uh, 20, uh, about 4,000 uh, calls a year. Um, and since starting, we have seen 28,000 people that we've made contact with. Some of these folks are coming through the system time and time again, um, which speaks to part of it is relationship and part of it is somebody needs to have a couple of hitting the crisis system a couple of times, but being able to hand them off to agency partners that are culturally competent, um, that you know, honor somebody's recovery um, through harm reduction, trauma-informed care, um, and strength-based. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, lead and reach, Karen Brandy. Thank you. Um, I know it may look like there's there are a lot of service providers, um, and um, you know, a lot of um, alternatives. To, to law enforcement. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, there is a lot of focus on trying to get somebody else to respond um, for things that 
are not crime that law enforcement has been responding to, um, which is great. Uh, but we, uh, the people that we serve are at the intersection of crime and behavioral health or poverty. And um, so we, our, our focus really is on individuals who are impacting the community because of engaging in law violations. Usually a group of people who are um, invisibilized or pushed into the margins, um, individuals who are not connected typically to services, um, individuals who are continually criminalized over and over and over because of experiencing poverty. Um, and, you know, it, it, the long-term case management really is important here because, you know, we, we can, we definitely need to build what happens up front and like, what is the response, but like, how is that person taken care of in the future? How is the person's real uh, needs addressed? How is, how are their chronic conditions addressed? Some people have been experiencing incarceration over and over for 20, 30, 40 years. Some of the people we work with have been experiencing homelessness for decades, experiencing substance use disorder or unmet behavioral health needs for decades and need intensive wraparound long-term care um, in order to try to prevent crises from coming up again for the same individual. And in order to prevent um, uh, people from calling 911 on these individuals. Um, we finally also have a community that has an increased desire in an alternative response to crime. Like we have businesses, we have organizations, we have individuals who are trying to ask us to respond and uh, for, for crime, they're talking specifically about um, criminal activity. And um, finally want uh, an alternative response and finally want to lean towards those sort of responses and um we just don't have the capacity to do it like lead has never been to scale the way it needs to be and now we have exponential growth in the desire for a lead response and lead has not been able to expand like that um and so it is you know, it's sad to be in this work and like seeing that people finally want to believe in a response that we have believed in for so long and people finally want to use it and we are starting to turn people away or starting to have to say no or having to really, really prioritize accepting only a small number of individuals. It's sad um, and it's, it's extremely difficult work. Um, <clears throat> and this is even after um, the council's 2019 um, uh, a slide to bring lead to scale by uh, 2023. We are we don't we don't even know exactly what that looks like now after the past year, right? Uh, bringing lead to scale, but there's a, an extremely increased demand and um, not enough resources to meet that demand. I'm gonna pass it to Brandy to continue. Um, Councilmember Holbert, when we talk about the, the gaps that exist, you know. We know for sure, you know, in America that the war on drugs is a vicious, vicious, vicious thing that has impacted many people. Um, me, myself, and my own lived experience have been impacted by that with direct takes to my family and loved ones. And so when you think about how that attacks people, we are dealing with that aftermath, you know, people who've been dealing with that for 20 years. And so you can't have a one-time um, crisis stop with people. It has to be in long-term case management. We know these people are not prioritized for housing in the right way healthcare, um, even with navigating their legal system stuff, we, we know they're not prioritized at the right rate um, with really getting services. And so we're at the intersection with those folks have been hit by this, this war on drugs. And I'm particularly talking about black folks right now um, because they don't even fit into the gaps of other homeless service systems and healthcare systems that get help. The only way they've been able to get help, unfortunately, is through an intersection where crime is happening, but it's racist in itself. And so you're having people, um, we're with them for that long-term piece. And so we need to be taking a scale to be in more communities, especially now that um, we're able to do this community referral in a real way for these people who have been impacted this way. We have to do this. Even though as a country we recognize how the war on drugs has been racist, we haven't been able to uh, rectify that with giving those folks robust services to be sustainable and reintegrate back into communities. And so when I see that gap, you have to have that overlay of having a racial equity analysis, long-term services, and services that connect them to um, sustainable things like housing, mental health, 
health care and their legal systems gaps. And so that has to be beyond just a crisis response. Thank you, Brandy. Um, Lieutenant Piskonski? Uh, yeah, I, you know, a lot of really, really poignant things brought up there by uh, by the previous three. And, you know, we see a lot of those same those same issues, right, that we're encountering. Um, scale is certainly an issue. Uh, you know, as, as, as I had mentioned, you know, at, at the current rate, Seattle Police Department has about 10,000, you know, crisis calls a year that we're responding to. And, you know, the, the, the math works out to about 26 a day. Um, you know, again, we, we have five teams. <laughs> there, there's just no way to appropriately respond with that capacity um, to be able to be out there and be, you know, effective on a 24 seven basis. So we are really, you know, kind of managing that with a lot of smoke and mirrors with a lot of, um, you know, just doing the best we can with the resources that we've got. Uh, we are also experiencing, even with those five, we are also experiencing some short staffing issues right now as well. So we're not even at, we were, we're not even at our full capacity um, of what that looks like. So definitely some gaps there. Uh, if there wants to be some, some growth, uh, you know, in, in, in applying that stuff, one of the things, a couple of things that got brought up, I was just jotting some, some notes down um, with the, you know, with the alternatives and having non-police responses to a lot of these, these types of calls, we actually see um, a really high percentage of those crisis calls that get generated for the department that, become 911 calls are, are actually coming from the service providers themselves, um, whether they're supportive housing facilities, whether they're, you know, various case managers, um, the, you know, facilities that might be offering services, stuff like that. We have an extremely large percentage of those crisis calls that are being generated by those service providers. And that really kind of puts things in a quandary because you know, if the question is, okay, well, how do we not have police respond? And instead we have alternative social service providers giving that response, but they're the ones that are calling 911 now to, to come and connect with their, <clears throat> excuse me, with their clientele. So we kind of get into a circular conversation there a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, of what that response is going to look like uh, as a whole from a, from a law enforcement standpoint. Um, it, as a as a department, uh, as some of you are aware, some of you might not be aware, we actually track. Um, excuse me, there I had to try and clear my throat. Um, we actually track every one of those crisis interactions, and in there we have a lot of check boxes that are related to, um, you know, everything from the observable words, actions, and behaviors of the individual. So what what an officer might be encountering. Um, and then to the closing end of what those dispositions are. So was it, you know, uh, a referral to services? Was it a, uh, you know, involuntary or voluntary trip to the hospital? Um, was it an arrest? You know, what, what are all those possible dispositions there? And now over, let's see, we're six plus years into tracking that. So we're somewhere in the closing in on 60,000 crisis templates that we have, data associated with, um, and we track at a less than 10% arrest rate. So for all of those crisis calls that are occurring, we're in the nine-ish um, percentile, uh, nine-ish percentage of those encounters that end up in an arrest. So we're, we're really looking for the alternatives, um, you know, and not taking a traditional law enforcement response to individuals that are experiencing those behavioral health issues. But but trying to reconnect them to those other services. Um, additional resources, additional accesses. Again, I can't say enough thank you to our partners, to the stakeholders that are out there because, you know, it, it doesn't matter the amount of training or bodies that we get if we don't have those partners to be able to connect folks back to. You get the traditional law enforcement response of we either take someone to the hospital, we take them to jail, or we walk away. And that's not good for the client that's not good for the individual <clears throat> of being able to connect them back to services so we can't have success unless we have the tremendous partners that are 
many of them here joining us today. Thank you. Um, and then um, folks from, from Health One, John and Scoggins. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really want to emphasize and reiterate what uh, Tiara and Brandy and uh, Lieutenant Piskonski said. Um, I, I think I'd, I would probably just focus on, on two right now or, or quite a few. Um, the first is, um, you know, like the Lieutenant was saying, is resource connections, and particularly uh, what my team in the field calls landing zones, which are brick and mortar locations where we can take clients. Again, you know, where can we take someone that is not in ED that's not a jail or not leaving them. Um, and, and, you know, first and foremost, that comes to mind for us is, you know, the DESC Crisis Solutions Center, but obviously their, their capacity is, is limited. Um, we would like to see more resources like that and particularly more uh, walk-in primary care and urgent care clinics that operate on, on the FQHC model, the federally qualified healthcare settle model, where they will take any any patient regardless of ability to pay. Um, it's, it's very difficult for us right now often to connect people with timely medical resources in town. Um, you know, a lot of the, the community health centers have essentially no availability on an ongoing basis. Um, we're, we're sort of cautiously optimistic for DESC's new um, clinic that they're opening in partnership with Harborview at the Hobson Clinic, um, but we really, I think, need to see more of that. Um, you know, day day centers, um, you know, psychiatric urgent care facilities, really any any place where we can get that sort of wraparound holistic care, and again, have those service provider connections. And then the other one, and I think this has been mentioned already, is um, you know starting to think about what would potentially be a nine one one or or next year a nine eight eight dispatchable um, civilian community led resource for quality of life issues for lower level behavioral crisis for things where again you don't necessarily need an spd patrol unit where you don't need an sfd fire truck to come um i i think that we've seen pretty clearly around the country that this model is doable i don't think that it is it's really theoretical i think that it can be done safely and effectively and then you get sort of a, a continuum of care basically starting you know with your community partners all the way up through you know fire police and, and co-responder models um I, I i think that there from what we have heard on our end there's quite a bit of interest in that in the community i think a lot of really exciting opportunities there to embed resources such as lead and desc and reach and, and perhaps even more sort of more local geographic resources before you even get to the uniforms of, of police and fire um so i i think that that is certainly aspirational but um i would i would certainly like to see that at some point in yeah thank you yeah, thank you. And I think that's a, that's a good segue over to, um, to Crisis Connections. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the future of, uh, of 988. I just want to, uh, again, for the viewing public, because of the gaps that we're talking about right now, um, if, you, if, if somebody in the public wants to call somebody and wants to know for certain that a uniformed police officer is not going to come because... Um, there's no guarantee that Health One is going to be able to go it, unless it is flagged in a particular way that results in 911 sending Health One. There's no guarantee that um, a crisis response unit with mental health professionals is going to go be, um, because of the capacity issues that we, we've heard from Lieutenant Pisconsi. So um, for folks who want to call somebody and be guaranteed that they're not going to get a um an, a, a response of um of police officers um right now crisis connections is 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 what we have to offer and um so that's why i'm also excited to to hear a little bit more um about how the system is going to is going to grow with nine nine eight eight um and i also just want to because um I don't want to. I really don't want to give the impression that because we're talking about all of these different crisis response systems, that um, that I mean, the foundation of this conversation is about um, the gaps, what's missing, and the uh, article that I um, I read from earlier um, said that in their analysis, and this is just of nine one one calls. It doesn't count. Um, the instances where 911 isn't called, but in their analysis of 911 calls, 38% of 911 calls could benefit from an alternative community response. Um, so again, that says to me that there's a lot of growing that needs to be done in this system. Uh, 
Well, 988 is a very large topic. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna answer your first question first, um, which is, you know, where do we see the gaps? Um, you know, one of the things that the, um, you know, the one call pilot has taught us is that there, there's room for, you know, crisis connection working close with law enforcement. Um, we found that relationship to be effective. We think we can do more. Um, we are worried about the funding for that program running out this year um, and making sure that, you know, law enforcement has us as a resource, making sure that law enforcement knows how to get in touch with us and how to interact with folks who are having a mental health or behavioral health crisis. We, we want to make sure that those folks are getting a kind, compassionate, and accurate response. And we don't um, expect cops to be social workers and we don't, you know, as social workers expect to be cops. I think there's a, there's a bridge there where we can help each other, you know, navigate those situations better. And I think one calls a good opportunity for that. Um, in relation to 988, um, one of the things that Crisis Connections does that I didn't touch on earlier is that we are a, a lifeline center. Um, so there's a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, that's a number, it's a 1-800 number, and that comes down to local contact centers. Crisis Connections is one of those. There's two, uh, two others currently in Washington State, um, and we anticipate that we will continue to be in that network of providers um, long term. And 988 is this transition from that 1-800 number to a three-digit number. Um, it's a federal law, and it's going to be coming out in July of 2020. Two, um, so about 400 days until this thing goes live, we're anticipating a, a you know just a really drastic ramp up in call volume as people get used to this three-digit number. Um, the legislature also passed um, a bill um, 1477 that put some funding into the system. Thank you to who, anyone who advocated on that. Great job. Um, it'll help with increasing the community response side of things with the mobile crisis teams. It'll also put more funding into the system for the contact center hubs. One of those will likely be crisis connections. Um, it will enable us to do um, bed tracking. It'll enable us to do tracking live of uh, mobile crisis teams out in the community so we can get them dispatched to the most um, appropriate and local crisis team out there. Um, it's going to require um, just a, a lot of system upgrades, a lot of um, upgrades to our technology increases to our staff, um, you know, trying to build a system that is designed in a way to get people out of the 911 system and into the behavioral health crisis response system. Um, historically, our, our lifeline um, contract has been funded at about $1,500 a year, um, which is just, you can't operate on that. And that's, that's not a lifeline's fault. There just wasn't any funding in the system. So um, this has been long overdue and we're looking forward to that um, scope of work so that we can respond, you know, to anyone who needs it. Thank you, Neil. Um, so just looking at um, the participants panel, including council members, are there um, questions that we want to ask of, of our panelists? Are there closing thoughts that panelists um, want to um, want to uh, make sure that we touch upon? Um, this is again, this is um, a really, really big conversation. I'm really appreciative that we took some time today um, to take a bite of it but i think it's it's one in um many conversations that we need to continue having um before we get um some recommendations um resulting from the the executive idp work uh council member Herber, i did have one thing to just add to that that i can't emphasize enough that in creating this alternative line if we don't think about that new nuance of crime and behavioral health um, it could be detrimental to communities of color, in particular black communities. So I just want to, if I don't lay anything else down for people to really pay attention to how we are going to serve that population that we serve, that are committing crime, that do have significant trauma and behavioral health. We don't want them to be met with a heavy hand. We want them to be met. Thank you, Brandy. Oh, let's see. Um, Councilman Morales. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody for for sharing this information with us. Um, I don't think any of this is a surprise. Um, we know that uh, across the city, we've got a lot of need. And um, I just want to respond to what what Tiara and Brandy were saying. Um, you know, we I have called uh, lead often to come to different neighborhoods in my district, um, you know, 
constituents across across South Seattle have been asking for support. Um, they don't want to call the police, but there are more and more people who are, um, you know, engaging in drugs. We find bullets under the Mount Baker light rail station. We know that there are um, there are lots of challenges that our community members have, um, and the reality is that um, these providers are tapped out. Uh, and so, you know, Tiara was kind enough to come and meet with some of the constituents in the Mount Baker area, but she also had to say, I, you know, we just can't come back to provide um, the kind of service that we would like to be able to do. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge um, this, as somebody was saying, you know, continuum of care is really important. Um, we know we need to get more housing in place, but we also know that people need help desperately. And um, I think as a city, it is our obligation to um, provide the resources that we need so that our neighbors are, are cared for, whether it is from their own private, you know, medical provider or from um, emergency response providers like like you folks. So thank you for what you do. And um, and I just want to say we hear you and know that uh, you need more support in order to do your work better. Uh, Councilmember Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I really appreciate having this conversation that's this really prescient, um, regardless of where we're having it, be it in the Public Safety Committee, or be it in the Select Committee on Homelessness, uh, all roads lead to some of these same systems uh, analyses and questions. Um, and I just want to want to flag, uh, you know, it's not a question, but just a comment on our conversation today uh, for strategic planning going forward and how we build and design a new system to accommodate the need that we see uh, when we're out in the city and from the constituents that we all hear from uh, as council members that we need to think of the proactive community building work uh, that LEAD has been doing um, as a leg of the stool of our overall system of public safety. And I think that historically there's been this tendency to, to really sort of limit it to kind of, you know, there's, there's the fire department, there's the police, you know, there's hospitals. Uh, and then things like LEAD are sort of these peripheral uh, um, sort of niche plans to respond to discrete things on the sidelines of some of these other systems. I think what's clear here to build on the work that this council has already charted out is LEAD is a, should be resourced and planned around as a full leg of our public safety um, chair, stool, whatever analogy you want to use. Uh, I mean, it's an indispensable uh, um, independent and proactive uh, uh, component of this work that causes um, a lot of downstream benefits when it is adequately scaled and resourced. So I, I think we need to really look into making that uh, or continuing our work as a council um, to build that out as a standing budget priority. Because uh, from the from what I have heard from our provider partners, that is something that will be outcome determinative for future capacity building uh, and for getting through this this constant uh, refrain that we've heard, which is, you know, if we have to scramble for our money every single budget cycle, every single year, we can't focus on the work and focus on building capacity. And, you know, that is something that we really need to be investing in to make sure that um, that that uh, that leg of the stool isn't wobbly, that it's strong, that we can depend on it, uh, and that it'll have benefits for all of these other um, actors that are doing the emergency response because they're just responding to less need in the community because we've dealt with it upstream in a, a proactive um, and culturally competent way. So I really appreciate what everyone shared here today and, and look forward to continuing that work uh, to make sure folks have the support that they need to be successful. Thank you, Lewis. So yes, um, this is uh, part of an ongoing discussion. I think um, foundational to that discussion, as, as Councilmember Lewis said, is um, to consider the the folks that we have here is as part of um, as part of our continuum, um, as part of a continuum that we uh, need to adequately resource um, in order to address the needs, but also um, 
inadequately resourcing, looking at ways to operationalize what we are resourcing in a way um, that um, addresses the greatest needs of those um, who have been um, poorly served by, by, by the current system. So really appreciate um, everybody being here with us today, um, as well as your important work um, on behalf of, um, of, on behalf of people who, who need your help. So thank you so much. All right, so moving on to the next item on the agenda. Clerk, can you please roll, read the item into the agenda? Agenda item number two. 2021 Seattle All Hazards Mitigation Plan. Thank you, Alex. Um, so we are joined today by um, the Office of Emergency Management. We are going to do a light touch on this because this plan will be back before this committee, um, I believe at the next meeting. So we're gonna hear from Curry Mayer, um, the Director of the Office of Emergency Management to do a quick briefing um, of what is in the plan and what we can expect uh, coming back us um, in, in a subsequent meeting. Director Mayor. Okay, so thank you. Um, so thank you, um, committee chair and council person Herbold for having me and also to the rest of the committee members for your interest in the hazard mitigation plan. Um, be, I'm about to share my screen here. I just have a few slides to, um, to share with you today. So I will bring that up, but I wanted to say in the meantime, also that the development of this plan is really due to uh, my team members um, and most especially Erica Lund, who is really the expert on this plan and she's here today. So I wanted to um, give a um, shout out and kudos and congratulations to Erica Lund. Uh, this is a really important plan and we are very uh, proud of that work. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, good. All right. So the hazard mitigation plan is a very large comprehensive document that gives all kinds of detailed information, first of all, about the types and of hazards that we face in in Seattle. So we have something called the Hazard Impact and Vulnerability Assessment or SHIVA for short. So it looks at all of those types of hazards we might face and then what are the actions that we can take to uh, mitigate those. And, and it's shown time and time again that the more you invest in mitigation in terms of action, the more money you save um, in response or when there is some kind of um, incident impact. So we're always we're always looking for what are those things that we can do up front in addition to making the community safer. Uh, so there were uh, many departments engaged in this work. We have a, um, it also coordinates with a number of other citywide plans, um, also codes and funding levies. It's also, uh, there's evolving information on community led investments in this update. And we have also adjusted the criteria to reflect the values for the RSJI um, initiatives, collaboration with the community, what, what resonates best with them, um, and also some other benefits that I'll hi highlight for you here. It's also important to note that kind of the um, process for this is that um, once we get community input and look at um, how we're best serving and, and actually mitigating the hazards in Seattle to the best of our ability, then it goes to the mayor and she has reviewed and approved it. And then here to all of you, council, it will soon be uploaded into the legislature database and then it will go to the state and ultimately to FEMA. It's important um, that it go to FEMA because we are eligible as a city to apply for additional grants and we'll actually receive more money if we have an approved hazard mitigation plan. So what do we plan to do in the future? Well, um, there are 47 mitigation projects in this updated version of the, of the plan. Um, we're also looking at implementing recommendations from past studies, especially uh, more seismic retrofitting of all kinds of structures here in Seattle, bridges, dams, reservoirs, retaining walls, some historic libraries. Um, and then we're also, as I mentioned, integrating the hazard mitigation policies into our next comprehensive plan update 
which has roles and responsibilities for all of the departments here within the city. We're also looking at um, designing some infrastructure to protect, protect South Park from sea level rise and also engaging that community in what does that look like um, and how can we best um, safeguard their community. Uh, we're looking at replacing a retaining wall on North, North Gateway and as I mentioned, seismic upgrades are always, um, always a big topic. Um, as you might have met, that I know you're all very aware of. Uh, we also, it's important to get community input on the plan and we're still doing some of that now as we speak. Um, but some of the results that we got back showed that earthquakes are the hazard of greatest concern, which is not a surprise to anyone. Um, and, and one of the things that we always look at um, when we're doing our planning and exercising and training with earthquakes is that there's always a cascade of other types of events that occur because of the earthquake. So when you talk about an earthquake, you're not really just looking at that one hazard, but all of those other things that happen as a result of the earthquake. So power outages, fires, um, you know, uh, blocked roadways, which impacts response vehicles, all those kinds of things will come out when we start doing planning and looking at what happens after earthquakes. So, but also the community was most concerned with how are we protecting um, critical facilities. Um, and so those facilities that support um, health and mental health in particular, homeless shelters and emergency shelters for everybody, food bank, food banks and also of course um, affordable housing and which of the which of those housing units are um, more vulnerable to to disasters we take a look at that as well so to date I know this is a little hard to see but you will you will get a copy of all this so you'll have all the details in front of you um, these are the projects that we have already engaged in um, the lead department for each of those projects and the principal beneficiaries in terms of um, um, either organizations or departments in the city of Seattle. But we have been awarded from the federal government in excess of $23 million in federal funding for projects and planning. We have three applications pending that are related to seismic um, retrofitting and that will total another $21 million. So as you can imagine, we're very proud of, of this effort. Um, and it really makes a difference for a lot of, uh, a, a lot of segments of, of our community. So the next steps, as I mentioned, is um, for you all to approve the council to have their approval um, once you've had a chance to look at it in, in addition to um, my briefing here, and then it will go to the state emergency management division, and then of course on to FEMA for that official um, approval. Um, and then I just wanted to give you a brief idea of how many of the different departments across the city have been involved in this effort. It really is a citywide effort. And as you can see here, all of the different groups and departments that were involved in this work. Um, that also helps us make sure that we reach community members in different areas and with different um, needs across the city. So we do the best job of really making a comprehensive plan that will do the most good for the most people. Okay, so that is um, the end of my um, overview. So I'm happy to take questions. And then also, as I mentioned, Erica is also here and if you have more specific. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Morales. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the earthquake slide. Um, yeah. As uh, a city surrounded by water and bridges that would very likely collapse. Um, yeah. And knowing that in any given grocery store, uh, you know, there might be three days worth of food. Can yeah. you tell us what the plan is? <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. it, it, we've we've all been told that three preparing for three days on your own is not nearly sufficient. We should really be planning to be on our own for two weeks in the event yeah. of an earthquake because you know our crisis response folks will be dealing with the crisis, so we need to have food and water and all of that for two weeks. Yeah, and yeah. grocery stores don't carry that much food. 
So yes. um, what's the plan? <laughs> okay, so I can highlight a couple of things. First, I wanna say kudos to you for knowing that. <laughs> I appreciate that, that's great. Um, uh, Cause also you can help us with, you know, making sure the community knows that three days is not enough. So, um, so the good news about us being close to the water is that unlike if we were at the open ocean where there would be a tsunami, because we're a little bit protected by the sound, we will have some water damage and high waves and whatnot, but we will not have a tsunami that directly impacts the city of Seattle. So that's good. So one of the things, really recent things that we're doing to look at what do we, how do we help people with, um, um, areas of the city that are cut off from one another. And we're looking at this concept called islanding or island kind of natural, because of the natural disaster of the earthquake, the kind of ways that um, that damage cuts off sections of the city, right? Because the freeway collapsed here, or you can't go over this bridge. Um, so there'll be individual islands, not islands surrounded by water, but cut off from other areas of the city. So we're looking at a number of things and this is brand new. So we're still in the early planning stages, but one helping the community understand what does that look like? What, a, you know, of course we can't say exactly how things will, will the damage will be, but we can have a pretty good idea. We know where the freeway overpasses and, and whatnot are. So looking at how can we strategically um, pre-position resources, city resources, so that they can help in those places that you may not be able to drive to another section of the city. So that's one part. So we're doing that with um, city departments. And then also helping the community understand um, and, and um, connecting with those community efforts that are already working on either preparedness or, or communications so that we can say if you're this is your likely to be your new neighborhood based on the damage of the earthquake what are those things that you as a community can do to help each other um, while you're while you're still disconnected um, so so we're just starting to look at that we're talking with the other the office of emergency management is talking with other department heads about um, what are the best ways that we can mitigate this, um, knowing where the fire departments are so that they can act as many hubs, uh, that, not fire departments, where the fire stations are. So if they, those could be mini hubs, what other types of resources are already in those areas and what do we need to um, store up either supplies, um, uh, shelter capacity, shelter supplies, those kinds of things. So that that effort is underway right now. The other thing that we're doing is helping first city um, departments and their teams understand is if you had to respond after an earthquake or help the city in some way based on your job, how would you get here without crossing a bridge or without crossing a body of water? Um, which is not impossible. It will take people longer, um, but it's but it's not impossible. We're also looking at what are the ways that we're going to communicate post earthquake so that we make sure we get that situational awareness um, and make sure that we can get help to the most people as quickly as possible. Um, so a number of those um, efforts in the earthquake planning area are are underway right right now, um, and it's been really. Um, um, exciting, I'll just say it like that, for me to now pivot and focus on earthquakes instead of uh, just talking about COVID. So we're very engaged in that work. Um, and if you have other suggestions or want to help with, you know, community outreach and getting the community to understand how, what are the things we're doing, I would really appreciate that. And Director Mayor, can you just very high level explain the difference between the all hazards mitigation plan and our earthquake preparedness plan? Yes. Sure. So the all hazards mitigation plan um, looks at all of those hazards that Seattle may be vulnerable to. Um, and we rank them um, so that earthquake shortly, the short, the earthquake plan is all about earthquakes. Um, and there are other hazards, while other hazards may also happen as a result of the earthquake, there's some peculiarities for other types of hazards that may not be included in the earthquake annex, which focuses on that. So this is more comprehensive. It ranks the hazards and then ties actions to those particular hazards.
Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, other hands raised. Um, Dr. Mayor, can you let us know when we can expect to receive um, the resolution and the draft plan? Really appreciate you being here to give us a preview. Yeah, you bet. Of course. Um, uh, yeah, it, it should be shortly. And I don't know, Erica, if you have a, a, a better idea of the time frame. Um, it was approved by the mayor a little while ago, so it should be in the as I my understanding is it's with the city attorney's office right now. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's my understanding too. We we did we did draft the um, the resolution and sent sent that on. So I think it's it's just still in process. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to flag here that um, as as part of the adoption of um the all hazards mitigation plan i'm uh really appreciate uh director mayor your willingness to speak to a group of uh georgetown residents who are really interested in ensuring that um there's engagement with that community around potential hazards associated with uh uh potential airplane crashes, jet crashes, um, and just maybe looking for um, some way to lift up their um, their aspirations uh, that OEM do some work um, with that community in, uh, in, in an effort to uh, work to mitigate um, their, their concerns and potential impacts of, of hazards that that community experiences. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm meeting with the King County International Airport Division Director today to talk more about what are some things we could do to, to specifically help Georgetown. Really appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. Okay, not seeing any questions, but we'll see you again soon uh, okay. for, for the council's action on, or this committee's action um, on the plan. Really appreciate your time giving us a preview. Yeah, you bet. Thank you so much for having me. And also um, kudos to all of you for looking at mental health issues. That's that's admirable. Um, I have, have some of that in my own family. And so I really appreciate um, that you're taking a look at that. That's awesome. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of people are looking for, for alternatives to, to 911 response uh, for those issues. Uh, people um, who have loved ones and, um, and, and friends in the community. So Right. appreciate that perspective from you as well. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. All right. Can we read the final item into the agenda, please? Agenda item number three, criminal legal system strategic plan. Thank you for reading the final item on the agenda into the record. <laughs> All right. So with that, um, we're going to hand it over to um, Carlos with uh, Carlos Lugo with Council Central Staff. Just as um, some some opening remarks, um, this item is a presentation um, on the criminal legal system alignment as part of the 2019 budget under the leadership of Council President Gonzalez. The council adopted a couple of budget actions to fund a term limited position in our department um, and um, also to fund a permanent position in the Office of Civil Rights so that we could coordinate stakeholder engagement around our efforts to realign the criminal legal system. The action requested um, a strategic plan implement recommendations that have already been provided to the city about the criminal legal system in order to reduce the harm caused by the criminal legal system to the people and communities who interact with it. Um, the strategic plan is one of two work products that we expect from this, from this body of work. Um, the second is a report containing recommendations from the community task force for criminal legal system alignment. And um, that is a work group comprised of nine community members who have been impacted by the city's criminal legal system. Um, over the last year, they've met regularly, convened by council central staff and the office for civil rights to provide recommendations for criminal legal system alignment. Um, we are in communication with the office of civil rights and members um, of, of the work group. Um, about their report and we understand that the task force is in the process of finalizing their report. Um, it is not yet ready, but uh, when it is ready, um, I hope that we can have them uh, present it in, in council um, as well. And with that, we'll hand it over to Carlos. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, let me just start off by saying I'm very excited to be presenting and this two years, culmination of two years of work. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and uh, for the record, my name is Carlos Lugo with your council central staff. And uh, let me just share my screen and we can get started here. Okay, uh, so I'm presenting on realigning Seattle's criminal legal system through a public health approach. As I mentioned, this is the culmination of two years of work, um, which comprised uh, council, council member uh, Herbold, as you said, uh, a mixture of not only the academic analysis and, and academic deep dive, which I'm presenting today, but also partnership with the Office of Civil Rights to engage community members that have been impacted by the system. Um, this report, however, what I'm presenting today focuses more on that academic uh, piece. And uh, as you mentioned, the work group itself will be presenting their own recommendations once that report is ready. Um, just to give you a little background as to my approach, um, I really started off with the idea of making sure that I was not only responsive to what council had asked in the council budget actions that created this position, in terms of looking at previously made recommendations uh, that hadn't been given to the city concerning the criminal legal system, but also with the idea that um, we have had engagements with community members for the past eight to 10 years, uh, specifically looking at different aspects of the criminal legal system. And so this project really started off with looking at what has been told to us uh, as the city over the past again, eight to 10 years by community members. And so starting that, I started really looking at specific questions that I wanted answered um, related to this realignment project. And so going through a review of those eight to 10 years of criminal legal system engagement reports, King County reports, community produced documents as well, concerning criminal legal system realignment, I was able to then go through all that and find the answers that were responsive to the starting questions that I had. And so being able to then group those questions into one document uh, really gave us a clear picture of what were the themes, the recurring themes that community has told us as the city, as the county, over and over again over the past eight to 10 years. And so pulling those out then and being able to compile them, I created what I called the community's guiding principles. And so these guiding principles really were that, they were the, uh, the guardrails to the rest of the research that I did, um, really the, the, the guiding star, if you will, uh, as this realignment project uh, developed and evolved. Um, also, as you mentioned, uh, Councilmember Herbold, the Community Task Force on Criminal Legal System Realignment will also be presenting their findings. Um, so I won't touch upon this too much uh, because of course their report is gonna have more information and, and have a lot more detail as to the process as well as the outcomes. So I'll just go right into the uh, academic analysis part. And so, as I mentioned, I had these guiding principles uh, as the starting point. And so what I did then was using those guiding principles, I went in and did uh, a lot of research as to best practices, talked to criminal legal uh, experts across the country, um, really tried to figure out what were models, what were theories in criminal justice that were responsive to what community has told us through these uh, community guiding principles. And so what I ended up coming up with was really centering on the risk needs responsivity model and really taking the risk needs responsivity model or r, &R as it's called for short from uh, ideas that inform specific programs that are used in the criminal legal system uh, and really expanded that to reorient the system around these evidence-based ideas that were in line with what community has asked us. And so what I'm presenting today is a new way of using the research um, and really expanding that from the limited capacity where it's been used before to, again, reorienting the entire system around something that is not based on punitive measures and is backed by evidence-based practices and research and, again, uh, in involves what community has told us, uh, really centers that uh, in this work. And so the risk and responsivity model in short um, is rooted in behavioral psychology and it's concerned with addressing the causes of crime through reduction of what they call, uh, the researchers call criminogenic needs, which are unmet needs that can increase a person's propensity to engage in criminal behavior. And this model has been extensively studied in Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, 
And entities such as the Department of Justice, the National Center for State Courts, and the Crime and Justice Center have highlighted R&R principles within the recommendations for implementing evidence-based practices to reduce recidivism. And so going into what this is, the risk principle states that services and interventions should be matched to an individual's risk to reoffend, and that intensive services should be reserved for individuals who are at the highest risk of recidivating. And this is really for two reasons. One, uh, providing services uh, is expensive. It's, it's resource intensive. And so ensuring that we are targeting our limited resources in a way that's going to make the most sense um, is going to give us the best uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. But uh, I would say even more importantly, the research also tells us that when we're looking at applying interventions, um, if we end up mixing folks from different risk levels, so someone that is, for example, uh, has a high risk of becoming involved in the criminal legal system repeatedly, and we mix them in programming with folks that are low risk, it's actually criminogenic um, and can in negatively impact low risk folks and make it more likely that they will uh, cycle through the system as well. Um, and so a lot of this is really looking at how do we reduce the harm that the system causes while being effective, uh, more effective than what we are right now in ensuring public safety. Uh, the need principle states that intervention should focus on addressing criminogenic needs because those are the major causes of crime. And I'll go through those uh, criminogenic, criminogenic needs in the next slide. And lastly, the responsivity principle, which states that intervention should employ behavioral, social learning, and cognitive behavioral influence and skill building strategies. And then the, resp the specific responsivity principle, uh, which as R&R has progressed and evolved, um, I think really reflects a lot of the values that we've talked about in the city of Seattle concerning criminal legal system realignment over the past few years. And that is that services should be delivered in a way that's responsive to clients' individual learning styles, which would include building on strengths, reducing personal and situational barriers to full participation and treatment, establishing high quality relationships, delivering early and often on matters of personal interest and starting where the person is at. So these are the misdemeanor risk need factors that have been identified as to what uh, increases an individual's propensity to engage in, in criminal behavior. And when this model was originally created, it really focused on the felony system, but the Center for Court Innovation in New York ended up doing an analysis uh, and a study of the misdemeanor needs in their misdemeanor population. And so what they found was that there was a large overlap between the two uh, with one exception, and that is the bottom one, homelessness or housing insecurity. That was found to be very relevant to folks that are going into the misdemeanor system, not so much the felony system. Um, but most of these needs, except for the first one, which is previous criminal history, are dynamic. That first one is static, but the rest of them, because they are dynamic, means that we as government, as a city, can apply interventions and have responses that alternatively could make things better and reduce these criminogenic needs, leading to folks being less likely to be involved in the legal system, or uh, a lot of the times the actions that we take in our legal system can actually negatively impact these criminogenic needs and make it more likely that folks recidivate and cycle through the system and get caught into this revolving door. Um, as we've seen, particularly with uh, a lot of what was coming out with the high barrier individual work group meetings that the mayor uh, had put into place a few years back. But um, as an example, I'm just going to leave this quote here. It's, I, don't, I don't need to read it. But um, this is an example of how the actions that the city takes, or really any city that's working on, uh, on criminal legal system issues, uh, it shows that the actions that we take can negatively impact so many different aspects of a person's life as they're going through the system. And so this is a quote from uh, previous work, the reentry work group that was published back in 2018. But I think it does a really good job of encapsulating how it is that even three days of jail can impact so many different aspects of this individual's life. Um, and you can see the, the ties between increased criminogenic needs right there when they're talking about homelessness, about jobs, about relationships, and, and potentially losing uh, custody of their children. So how is r and different from traditional criminal legal system responses? Well, what's interesting to me, as I mentioned, is that uh, r and has primarily been used in prisons to look at prison type of programming for individuals that are sentenced. Um, that said, there are a lot of things that this, uh, I would say and argue, falls short of in terms of what the research actually tells us. 
when we're taking someone away from their family, for instance, and putting them in a situation where they're in prison or in jail, when they're away from pro-social connections, as I mentioned, we're making things worse. And more importantly, when you actually look at what the research says and go into the source material of what the authors that created the risk-needs responsivity model have said, they've highlighted that cognitive behavioral therapy and human services are more effective in correctional sanctions at reducing recidivism, and that it's through human, clinical, and social services that the major causes of crime can be addressed. And lastly, that treatment is more effective in a community setting than a carceral one. So th the argument that I'm making is that r and is a viable model to realign our criminal legal system around. It just hasn't been used appropriately in a way that has the greatest uh, amount of impact. And so the other thing that looking at the risk needs responsivity model allows us to do is we can shift our criminal legal system into one that's no longer punitive, but really is based on a public health model. And so this right here is recommendations, or at least the process that the World Health Organization has used in their campaign for violence prevention. And so we'll go through these really briefly, but you can see defining the problem through information collection and analysis. I would argue that we've largely done that uh, at this point in the city, looking at what, what do we need to do? Um, where are we in terms of uh, criminal legal system uh, solutions and, and uh, responses? What are some of the problems and the shortfalls? And I would certainly argue that uh, the presentations earlier this morning, um, I think, did a, a wonderful job of touching on some of those, uh, those issues that need to be addressed. Um, secondly, establishing why violence in the WHO's case occurs, in our case, misdemeanor violence occurs, using research to determine the causes, the factors that increase or decrease the risk of violence, and the factors that could be modified through interventions. And so to me, this is really where the heart of the r, &R model comes into play precisely because it tells us just what those factors are and it gives us a guide, uh, it gives us a plan um, that we can use to really look at the interventions that we have to determine whether they are addressing criminogenic needs in a positive way or alternatively in a negative way. Uh, so right now where I see us being is really step three. So finding out what works to prevent violence or misdemeanor crime by designing, implementing, and evaluating interventions. And that's what I'm attempting to do uh, with this presentation as well as the larger written work. Uh, and then lastly, implementing interventions through different points in the system and monitoring and evaluating the impact on those risk factors. And as we are shifting to uh, a public health model, there are other public health tools that we can use to design these interventions and make sure that they are appropriately targeting individuals at appropriate places in the criminal legal system. And so what I'm showing up here at the top of the screen, this is the sequential intercept model, which was originally created to look at the inter points of interception, that's why it's intercept model, the points of interception that folks that are suffering from mental health or substance use disorder have as they go through the criminal legal system. And so each one of these points of interception, uh, the idea is that they are opportunities to create off ramps so that we can have people exit from the more punitive system and to actually address what are the causes that brought them into the system to begin with in a non-punitive type of way. And so in this report, uh, what I really focus on is uh, intercept one, which is initial interaction with law enforcement or the 911 system. Intercept two, which is initial detention or initial court hearings. And then I conclude talking about intercept zero, um, and there's a reason for that, and I'll, I'll get to it a little later in the presentation. But in terms of intercept one recommendations, what I'm looking at then is increasing investments in non-police 911 alternatives, such as Health One, um, and certainly there are more that the city council has invested in over the course of the past few years. Uh, and again, this, this morning, I think we heard about some fantastic programming. Um, but the other portion of that is making sure that we're also updating our emergency dispatch protocol so that we can expand the use of those alternative responses. As it currently stands, the Seattle Police Department uh, through the Seattle Police Officers Guild collective bargaining agreement with the city, uh, quote unquote, owns the body of work that's related to behavioral health crises. And so what this means is that generally, if someone calls 911, and requests uh, assistance for someone suffering from a behavioral health uh, episode, um, because the Seattle Police Department owns that body of work, they are likely to be the first responders there, um, which we know can lead to 
uh, unfortunate inc incidences and even the death of folks that are experiencing those uh, behavioral health crises. And so being able to, to expand the use of these alternatives um, would really allow the city to be able to, to make the best use of the investments that they've made. Uh, secondly, is looking at policing practices. And so this really addresses recommendations that have been made not only by the city's uh, reentry work group, um, this is one of their top recommendations, but uh, also, as I mentioned, the Guiding Principles talks about this a lot. And uh, this is also in line with President Obama's Commission on 21st Century Policing, which also recommended uh, that we look at employing alternatives such as summons uh, for arrest for misdemeanor crimes. And so as an example, um, what I can highlight is that the city of New Orleans back in 2008 actually passed an ordinance through their city council, which essentially mandates that officers use arrest alternatives for most cases, except where uh, it, there's an, a situation where the officer um, feels that it is uh, absolutely necessary to ensure public safety to conduct that arrest. But in those circumstances, the officer would need to be able to list the reasons and really enunciate why it is that they believe that that circumstance warranted an arrest versus uh, an alternative. And so again, like this really looks at uh, in Intercept One, what we can do to reduce the harm uh, that the system causes by not negatively impacting these criminogenic needs that we've talked about. In Intercept 2, the recommendations that uh, I put forward in my report are really focused on two different aspects. One is pretrial detention, and the second one is in diversion. And so the first one with uh, pretrial detention, um, we know that pretrial detention uh, through the use of the, the cash bail system uh, not only disproportionately impacts individuals from our BIPOC communities, but also um, has a lot of unfairness in it because bail is cash bail. It relies on a person's ability to pay um, to be able to release, to be able to be released. Um, so this, this would really, again, go to the heart of how do we reduce the harm that the system causes through punitive measures. And so the recommendations on this part are to promote community-based pretrial release. This is actually something that was previously recommended by the bail reform work group, which uh, council member Herbold, I believe uh, that was one of your initiatives. And uh, the Seattle Municipal Court in that report was open to that idea. And essentially the way that that would work would be to have a community-based group be able to provide services to help that individual stay out of trouble and ensure that they get to their uh, to their hearings um, so that they don't miss it, they don't have a, a warrant out for their arrest, um, which then could lead to incarceration. And so what these uh, community-based groups would do with proper funding or could do would be to be, uh, would be to be able to offer services such as childcare if needed for a working parent that needed to get to court. Um, alternatively, it could be looking at transportation if that's one of the impediments to making sure that they can uh, they can arrive for their hearing. Um, but it could even be as simple as making sure that they're in touch with that individual through phone, through email, through those types of, uh, of mediums, uh, just to be able to build that connection and remind that individual about their upcoming court date. And, and again, just make sure that they have whatever they need to be able to get there um, and avoid the negative consequences that could come. Um, the other alternative uh, that we could also look at is just eliminating the burden of cash bail by creating uh, or funding a community bail fund. And this is something that the city of New York through their city council was able to do uh, a few years back. They actually created what they called Liberty, Liberty Fund um, precisely to bail folks out of uh, jail for these misdemeanor offenses. Um, but more locally, uh, since we're, we're here in King County, uh, King County put out an RFP a couple of years back to contract with a community bail fund exactly for that express purpose. Um, but moving beyond bail, the other recommendation is to look at really expanding diversion alternatives, particularly at the pre-filing stage uh, or even further up uh, upstream where possible at the arrest stage so that we could reduce the costs and then also eliminate the creation of harmful criminal records while still uh, having accountability and addressing criminal violations. And so we can do this by expanding uh, not only the alternatives that we have now and certainly 
Um, when we look at programs such as the LEAD program, the Familiar Faces initiatives uh, that we have in partnership with King County, they address these criminogenic needs uh, in a way that has shown a lot of success. Uh, but what we could do is to make sure that we are using validated risk needs assessments so that we could match individuals with the appropriate level and type of support that they need to make sure that they stay out of the system. And so the recommendation on this portion would be uh, to do this uh, validated risk needs assessment at the prosecutor stage, but really preferably through a community-based partner um, that would be able to administer these assessments in a community setting and then uh, in conjunction with the city attorney's office, be able to determine the most appropriate diversion program for these individuals with really with the idea of going away from prosecution and harmful incarceration. Um, but in order to do that, uh, again, echoing what some of the presentations this morning said, we really do need to look at increasing funding for social services and for things like permanent supportive housing, which has uh, a lot of evidence-based research showing that it does decrease recidivism, particularly in the folks that are most likely to cycle in and out of the, the misdemeanor system. Um, so what I'll say with this is that, again, we have wonderful diversion programs in the city and in King County, but one of the biggest issues that I've seen over the course of research, and I think we heard this this morning as well, is that there's capacity limitations for a lot of the support services that they work to have people enroll in or that they could recommend for folks that are going through these. And so we do have a, a shortage of spaces, for example, for not only affordable housing, but also for substance use disorder uh, treatment. Um, and so absent the capacity to enroll folks in those needed treatment programs, um, we're really limited in what we can do in terms of diversion um, and be able to address these criminogenic needs in a way that's, that's humane, that's in line with guiding principles, and that ultimately is gonna be more effective in the punitive system that we have now. Carlos, I just want to take a quick pause here. Um, I, I want to flag that as it relates to um, diversion, um, particularly pre-filing diversion, particularly pre-filing diversion that actually does not, no longer requires any um, any interaction with the police department in order to facilitate the diversion. Um, the the folks who who do that work, you mentioned lead, um, don't consider themselves in an intercept um, one program. They consider themselves in an intercept zero program. So I just want to want to flag that. Thank you. No, thank you, and uh, and certainly. Uh... There's more detail in the written report, so I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, so I, this is really just a general overview, but yes, you're absolutely right. Um, what LEAD has done is really expanded to the Intercept Zero focus, um, which goes into what we're talking about here, um, that as we are planning the system and looking at how we can be most effective, creating the least amount of harm, Intercept Zero is really where we need to look at. And so I ended up putting intercept zero last because that mirrors the development of the sequential intercept model. When it was first created, it really looked at intercepts one through five. And so it really focused on what we can do uh, through these different stages to address folks that are going through the system. Um, but later on, as the researchers looked at the work and, and uh, as this, uh, the idea evolved, they created intercept zero, which they called really the ultimate intercept because this is an opportunity to address needs before folks get involved in the system. Um, and so this is really when we're talking about prevention and uh, making sure that we're taking steps to reduce the need or the use of the criminal legal system, Intercept Zero is really the, the hero in this, um, so to speak. And so as we look at, uh, or if the city starts implementing some of these recommendations, and um, of course we do have a jail contract with King County, but if uh, it would be possible to continue these negotiations and to reduce the spending on the jail contract, which at this point is, I believe, around 18 to 20 million dollars a year, um, that then would allow us to be able to use the savings from that uh, to be able to put into other programming. Um, so we would see a, a reduction in arrests and obviously the costs associated with that, pretrial detention, punitive post-trial incarceration. And so the idea really is to then be able to reinvest those savings from the reduced jail and court use to historically under-resourced communities where we do see the most need uh, because of deprivation. And so um, the uh, certainly the Black Brilliance Project, I think laid out um, a, a vision for how participatory budgeting could work. Um, but the idea here would be to uh, look at what are investments in programming that could reduce 
criminogenic needs uh, to reduce the use of the system. And really, if we're looking at even more upstream solutions, what we really have to look at are adverse childhood experiences. Um, and these are really important because the research shows us that ACEs, as they're called for short, um, are traumatic experiences which can cause toxic stress in children and repeated exposure to toxic stress through multiple ACEs as they grow can affect their brain development. Um, it can actually harm their nervous, endocrine, and immune systems, and even the physical structure of their DNA. And so as they experience higher levels of ACEs, uh, what we've seen is that children struggle to learn, they struggle to complete schooling, and they're also at a higher risk for engaging in violent behavior and becoming involved in the juvenile criminal legal system. And as we looked at uh, these criminogenic needs, previous criminal history is one of the factors that we can use to uh, to predict propensity um, for criminal legal system involvement. Um, but further than that, uh, we also see that the Centers for Disease Control, for example, have noted that adults who experience higher levels of ACEs uh, may face increased employment instability, leading to struggles with finances, jobs, and families, and that these can then have a cyclical intergenerational impact on children who, because of that, could then uh, experience their own ACEs as a result. And so. This is really a way to stop the intergenerational trauma um, and what we see with uh, a lot of this being um, folks that, that have this deprivation uh, and how that's passed to, to their children. Uh, and, and we really, really do see this, uh, what we talk, to, talk about the school to, to prison pipeline. Um, but talking about uh, how these ACEs can also impact, um, there have been studies that look at the number of ACEs that folks that have been convicted, convicted of a crime have relative to folks that have not. And what we do see, uh, again, in the research is that uh, folks that are adults, is particularly adult males that are convicted of a crime, reported having nearly four times as many adverse childhood events uh, as adult males in the normative, in the normative sample. Um, and so really, again, going back to prevention um, and making sure that we're addressing the causes of these criminogenic needs as early as possible is going to be the way to reduce the use of the system. Um, and so what this would look at is, for example, child care, health and mental health services, employment services, early education programs, and then affordable housing as well. Uh, and then my last slide here, uh, I won't go into this in too much detail because it is included in the report. But one of the final pieces that council asked me to look at as I was uh, engaging in this criminal legal system realignment work was to make recommendations on reimagining the criminal justice coordinating council. And uh, if the city moves forward with implementing uh, some of these recommendations, um, keeping in mind the guiding principles, one of the main ones was ensuring that any type of work such as this um, is involving community members from communities that have been most impacted by the system and ensuring that we're taking their considerations uh, into the planning and into the execution. And so um, these are just the recommendations that I would have on, on recreating the CJCC. But again, this is a, a brief overview because I know we have limited time, um, but the, the report itself goes into a lot more detail as to the research, uh, the methods, the recommendations, and the supporting evidence. Um, and, before I close, the last thing that I'll say is that um, as I engaged in this work, one of the things that I, I made sure to do, apart from um, having the, the fidelity to what community has told us in the past, was also reaching out to folks from different uh, national level institutions that are working on this type of research and this, th these types of developments. Um, and so one thing I just wanted to highlight, for example, is that I did speak with subject matter experts at organizations such as the Center for Court Innovation, um, and they commend this plan as reflective of not only current research, but also of inclusive leading approaches to justice system reform and realignment. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Carlos. Just looking to see if there are any raised hands here. Um, really appreciate the work that you've done, Carlos. Count Morales. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Um, so Carlos, thank you for this. I appreciate, um, I know you've been working on this for a long time <laughs> uh, and really appreciate the work that you're doing here. And I know you've been doing a lot of work with community and with the um, community task force as well. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned, uh, you know, possibly using 
if we're able to reduce the spending on the jail contract, using it to support some of the investments that we need in the intercept zero kinds of um, activities. Um, I would be interested to know your thoughts about um, why not also diverting funds, you know, using funds that we're diverting from SPD rather than into the city attorney's office. If we're really trying to kind of shrink the whole criminal legal system, um, you know, using that fun, those resources as well into investing in this intercept zero type of um, alternatives. Yeah, um, so thank you for your question, Councilman Morales. Uh, and honestly, I mean, my answer is we absolutely should do that. Um, in terms of looking at, uh, at spending, my recommendation would be to, to make sure that we are looking at not only what can we do upstream, but also how can we, how can we use funds to make sure that the system that we have now is also addressing these needs, is not punitive. And so as we see uh, um, a move away from funding some of these uh, services that we currently fund, such as, uh, let's say, the police at the level that we are, particularly when we're talking about overtime spending, when we're talking about um, behavioral health crises, for instance, and that there would be uh, budget savings from that. And in fact, one of the other things I'll say is that when we look at alternatives to arrest, that is also one of the big selling points that um, the International Association of Ch Police Chiefs put out as a potential cost-saving measure is if we do employ these alternatives to arrest, um, the officer's time is reduced in terms of how long they are at that stop um, or engaging with that individual versus obviously what would happen if we're taking them to jail and the booking process. And so that could see an additional cost savings. Um, and so, so the recommendation here isn't to just look at intercept zero, but to look at how we can use those savings um, to not bring new money into the criminal legal system, but to really take from one part and put it into something that we know is gonna be more effective and less harmful. And Carlos, just to uh, respond to um, some of the public comment that I thought I heard around um, the recommendations. I, the recommendations I saw about um, funding for uh, the city attorney's office was, I only saw cho choose 180 and th that sort of a, um, a diversion program highlighted. Are there other investments that this report recommends? There, there is. Um, right now, the way that uh, we have our system set up um, and, and largely uh, talking to our city attorney's office and uh, looking at research or, or putting at, or looking at what they have put out. One of the impediments that we would have is that it currently takes the city attorney's office about 187 days to make filing decisions. Um, and so the problem with this is that research also tells us that the greater amount of time that lapses between that initial interaction with a police officer, and especially if we're talking about not taking folks to jail, but using alternatives to arrest, the more time that, that lapses between that interaction and that first court date increases the likelihood that folks are going to have a failure to appear for court. Um, and so part of what I mentioned in the report, uh, which would be the one aspect where we could uh, increase the system would be looking at taking some of the funds that are saved from potentially police department, putting those into the city attorney's office to expand the number of prosecutors that they have for the, ex the ex explicit purpose of making charging decisions at a faster rate. And that could be provisoed so that it's not used for prosecution, that it's only used for the diversion uh, division within the criminal, uh, the criminal division of the CAO. Um, so really limiting the use of those funds in a way that's not punitive but that increases the likelihood that folks aren't going to get those FTAs and then have the punitive responses that come with having those, uh, those warrants out. Thank you, that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like we may have just lost our quorum. <laughs> um, but I, I think we got, we got to the end here. Um, really appreciate all of your work, Carlos, and, and the work of folks at SOCR, and of course, um, the many, many uh, years and hours uh, put in um, by uh, community members who participated in, in, the, in the work group, and, as well as their, their, um, their lived experience. And um, I think the, t the title of your report, um, remind me what, what it is, Carlos, because I think it, it really, um, I think does a nice, nice job of, of honoring that, um, 
uh, that <laughs> had. Um, so the title is Realigning Seattle's Criminal Legal System Through a Public Health Approach, the Intersection Between Community Wisdom and Evidence-Based Practices. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That, Thanks for the opportunity, Council Member. All right. Be well. You too. Okay. So the next Public Safety and Human Services Committee meeting is scheduled for June 22nd. And before we adjourn, are there any comments from my remaining <laughs> committee members? All right. Great. Then it is uh 12 11 p.m and we are adjourned thanks so much appreciate it <laughs>